Question number one. A 59-kilogram woman and a 71-kilogram man sit on either side of the edge of a seesaw that is 3.5 meters long. Where is their center of mass? So here I have the man on the left side and the woman on the right side. And we're going to use our center of mass equation for this problem, which states that the sum of the masses multiplied by the position of the center of mass is equal to the individual mass of each object, one and two, in this case, the man and the woman, and their relative positions, x1 and x2. Again, the capital M is the sum of their masses. So first thing you wanna do for this type of problem is, is choose your starting point when measuring x or the position. In this case here, if we measure from the man, the distance to the woman is 3.5 meters. Now, if you look at the equation here, we've summed the masses of the man and the woman. The position of the center of mass is what we're trying to solve for. And notice this zero here. The reason why this is zero is because the distance from the man to the man is zero. So you want to be smart and think for a minute about where you're going to measure your relative positions. I could have chosen a spot way out here to start measuring, but why? If I choose the man, then that goes to zero. So we're left with the following, where the center of mass, the position of the center of mass is equal to 59 times 3.5 divided by the sum of their masses because this goes away. That gives you a final answer of 1.6 meters. Now that is from the man here. So the entire uh, seesaw is 3.5 meters. So here at the fulcrum here, it's uh, 1.75 meters, and we're saying that the position of the center of mass lies somewhere on this side, which makes sense because we have the man who has greater mass on that side. So the center of mass for the man-woman system would lie closer to the man than it would the woman. Now let's take a, a look at solving this another way here. Let's switch them up. So now we have the man on the right, the woman on the left. And again, we've chosen the position to measure from the left side, which is where the woman is now over to the man, which is 3.5 meters away. When we solve it this way, we get the position of the center of mass to be 1.9 meters. Again, that's from this position over to here. If this is 1.75, then 1.9 would be over here, which makes sense because it's closer to the man and the man has a greater mass when compared to the woman. So you can solve this Either way, question number two, we have a fisherman in a boat catches a great white shark with a harpoon. The shark struggles for a while and then becomes limp, so no longer moving at this point. And that is a distance of 300 meters from the boat. The fisherman pulls the shark by a rope. And during this operation, the boat, initially at rest, moves 45 meters one direction toward the shark. The mass of the boat is 5,400 kilograms. In this problem, you are asked to find the mass of the shark, and we are also told to neglect any frictional forces exerted by the water. So, a reminder of a fact preceding these problems. The center of mass of a system is going to obey Newton's second law. In this case, the center of mass is at rest. It's not moving because the boat is, was initially at rest when this problem starts and the shark has stopped fighting. So it is at rest. So if we consider where the center of mass of the boat shark system lies, 
then that position will not change. So this means that the boat and the shark will meet at their center of mass. And I've gone over some of these problems in class. We've talked about the, the motion of the center of mass in previous units. So this is an application of the fact that the center of mass will obey Newton's second law. So the center of mass of the boat shark system would be somewhere around in here, which means once the shark has stopped fighting and the uh, fisherman begins to reel in the shark, they will meet at their center of mass. In this situation, the boat moves just a little bit to the right and the shark moves a lot more to the left and then they meet at their center of mass. That should make sense because the boat is so much more massive than the shark. So now we can mathematically use our center of mass equation acknowledging that at this moment, the distance to the center of mass of the boat shark system is zero. This is one way you can solve this problem. So we have the mass of the system. Here's the boat. We're trying to find the shark. Notice the position, zero. Again, that is because we're starting at the center of mass where they meet. So the distance from their center of mass to their center of mass is zero. And that is equal to the individual masses. Again, we have X variable here for the mass of the shark, which is what we're trying to find, and their relative positions. So we are told in this problem that the boat moves 45 meters. Well, that means 300 minus 45 or 255 meters must be the distance that the shark moves. And that shark is moving to the left, okay? Based on the way this problem is set up, that's how the signage works out. Now, going ahead and manipulating this a bit further, we can solve 4x by simply dividing the left side by a negative 255 meters. All I've done here is simplify this algebraically. I have moved this to the left side and divided by um, negative 255. And that's going to give me the position of the center of mass, or which I can now solve for the mass of the shark. All right, so notice here, my distances go away and I am left with the mass of the shark to be 953 kilograms. Um, it's nice to see that the signage works out. Mass is scalar, so this makes sense. And looking at that mass relative to the boat, it's much smaller. So this great white shark, although it is giant, is, um, is, is small relative to the mass of the boat. The boat moves a little bit to the right. The shark moves a lot to the left. They meet at their center of mass, which was initially at rest, so it stays at rest. And um, this is one way that you can solve this problem. A 70 kilogram man is standing at the end of a 250 kilogram log. It's floating in the water. Both the man and the log are at rest. Now, if you viewed question two, we just got done talking about the center of mass of a system. And this is important because the center of mass of the man log system is at rest. Therefore, it will stay at rest. The log is 3.0 meters long. If the man walks to the other side of the log, how far will the log move in the water? Ignore any forces exerted on the log by the water. So we will neglect any of these frictional forces of the water on the log. Okay, so solving this problem using our center of mass equation that we've used in the last couple of problems, we have the mass of the log man system. 
the position of the center of mass, and that's going to be equal to the individual masses of the man and the log and their relative positions. Now, in question number one, we talked about choosing a position to measure that will simplify your calculations. In this case here, let's call the position of the man, let's start here. If we start here and measure to the left, that means the distance of the position from the man to the man is zero. So that means this part of the expression will go away, which just helps to simplify calculations. As I've mentioned in the last couple problems, this area that you choose to measure from, it's up to you. I can measure from way over here if I wanted to the left and then all the way to the center of mass of the log. I could choose a spot over here if I wanted to, but it really doesn't make sense to do that. But as I've done throughout the course, I would implore you to go ahead and try to do that. But you'll see those positions are relative and you'll get the exact same answer regardless of the method you choose. Now, solving for the center of mass here, we can find that the uh, center of mass, again, that will go away. The position of the center of mass is 1.17 meters. Okay, well, this is 1.5 meters, so we're lying somewhere, you know, over, in, over around in here for the man log system, which makes sense because the man is on the right side of the log, so the position of the center of mass of the system would be to the left of our reference point here, which is the center of mass of this log. So somewhere right in there, okay? Now, that's the center of mass of the system before the man moves. Well, the center of mass is going to remain at rest, obeying Newton's second law. So what we can do is we can now find the position of the center of mass after the man has moved. So when we do that, we can do a very similar calculation, except this time we are taking, again, the mass of the man log system, but we do have a value here because the man has moved three meters across the log. If you stop and think about these center of mass problems, they are intuitive. The man is going to move to the left, the log is going to move to the right. The man's gonna move three meters across the log to the left, and the log is going to move some distance less than three meters to the right. Why did I say less than? Compare the masses, 70, 70 for the man, 250 for the log, the log is more massive. Okay, so now we have numbers and we can go ahead and divide both sides by the mass of the system to solve for the position of the center of mass of the man log system after the man has moved. So now we find it to be over in here. Okay, which makes sense. Now, again, you have to think, pause the video and think about this. The center of mass stays at rest. The man moves to the left, the log moves to the right, but the center of mass relative to its position in the water stays the same. Okay, so now we have this position over here, which makes sense because the man is on this side. So the center of mass um, before was like right here and after is now over here and that means we can look at the difference between those positions before and after moving to solve this problem. So here we have the entire scenario before moving and after moving. We have the position of the center of mass before moving and after moving. So the change in the position of the log is equal to 1.83 minus 1.17. In other words, 0 0.66 meters to the right. Man moves three meters to the left. The log moves 0.66 meters to the right. And we have done this 
by looking at the position of the center of mass before the man moved and after the man moved. There's another way to do this as well based on the symmetry of motion. So what we can do is look at how far the man has moved. When we look at the center of mass here, which we calculated in the very beginning of this, we found it to be 1.17. And the center of mass of the log was at 1.5. That means that we have a 0 0.33 if you subtract these two meters, but we want to multiply that by 2 because once the man moves all the way over onto this side in scenario B, then we want we have another 0 0.33 meters. So 0 0.33 here, 0 0.33 here. Add them up, you get 0 0.66 meters, which is exactly the answer we got using a different method. As you know in physics, there's more than one way to do things, and that's what I love about this. A captain of a ship turns the steering wheel by applying a 20 newton torque. If he applies the force at a radius of 0.2 meters from the axis of rotation at an angle of 80 degrees to the lever arm, what torque does he apply? Now, I'm using this problem to make sure my students have a clear understanding for some of these, some of the terminology we're going to be using. And so in the preceding facts, you've seen terms like line of action, lever arm, moment arm. I'm going to elucidate those terms during this problem. Let's look at our steering wheel here. All right, so... Most students will plug and chug on this problem, and they'll get it correct, but they're really unable to articulate why they chose certain angles. They've just chosen to plug this into the torque equation and solve it, and they did indeed get the correct answer. But again, I want to clarify some of these terms. First, I want to look at this line that is extended. This is the line of action. So the line of action is the line through the point at which the force is applied, and you're going to extend that line in the same direction as the vector. So in this case here, it has been extended out this way. Other times you may find that you'll need to extend it this way. All right, but regardless, you're going to just take that force. It's like an imaginary line, and you're going to extend it out. That is the line of action. So in the next several problems, I want for you, even if you're not using it, to draw the line of action into your diagram. Now, here we have our axis of rotation and the distance, that radius, which is often referred to as the radial vector, extends from the axis of rotation outward. So that is our radial vector. Next, we're going to look at our distances and our angles. So our force that is applied is a 20 Newton force. This angle here between the force and the radial vector, or radius, is 80 degrees. And by definition, that's what we're using for the torque angle. All right, so you've seen in some of the previous videos that uh, this equation is, is very forgiving because oftentimes, even if you're not using the right angle, you're using a supplementary angle, but that's going to give you the exact same answer. So in this case here, whether you're using the sine of 80 or the sine of 100, you're going to get the same answer. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this a little bit further. We have torque is equal to, and we have our force, 20 newtons, our radius um, or lever arm or moment arm, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, sine theta. All right, so... Next step, let's look at an alternate way to solve for torque. So we can also solve for torque by taking the force and multiplying it 
by the perpendicular distance from the force or from the line of action to the axis of rotation. That, by definition, is known as the lever arm or the moment arm. You can also calculate torque by taking the perpendicular component of the force and multiplying that by the distance to the radi or excuse me by the distance from that force to the axis of rotation so we have three different ways here and they will all give you the exact same answer and i'm about to show that to you let's start with the typical go-to equation that I bet most of you used, and I bet most of you got the correct answer. If we put in values here, straight from the problem, sine of 80 degrees, you get that the torque is equal to 3.9 Newton meters, which is the correct answer. Let's look at this another way. Let's solve for torque using the perpendicular component of the force multiplied by the distance from the force to the axis of rotation. So, putting in some of our uh, vector diagrams here, you can see we have our force. Now we have this um, component here, and it is this component here that is perpendicular. It is only this component of the 20 Newton force that is actually causing a torque, is able to create a torque. This component down here is at um, an angle that has either sine zero, sine 180, regardless, zero. You will get zero torque from that. So find our 80 degrees right here this is our right angle right here and that leaves us 10 degrees at the top of the triangle and so using trigonometry to solve for that perpendicular component only we find that sine 80 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse let's put in some values here and we can solve and get that 20 newtons sine 80 is equal to the perpendicular component of this 20 newton force and that answer is 19.7 newtons and when you take 19.7 newtons and multiply it by 0.2 meters guess what you get the exact same answer of 3.9 newton meters so now we've used two of our equations to solve for the torque and they've both given us the correct answer. It is so important to me that you all understand how to use this formula and really what torque is. Here we've taken that perpendicular component of the force and simply multiplied it by the distance from the force to the axis of rotation. Let's use our third method now. In this method, we're going to simply take our force, 20 newtons, and we're going to multiply it by the lever arm or the moment arm. That is going to be shown as the perpendicular distance between the line of action. Remember, the line of actions that force extended and the axis of rotation. So we have already have our red dashed line here and that is the line of action. Now, on the diagram in blue, that is the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the axis of rotation. So here we have our 90 degree angle, okay? That's our 90 degree angle. The blue arrow is the, the lever arm and oftentimes also called the moment arm. So, looking at our angles here, we have our 10 degree, we have our 80 degree, and of course our 90 degree angle. Let's take a closer look at this so we can really make sense of what's going on here. So, if we are to solve for our perpendicular, which is the lever arm or moment arm, 
We can do this by taking and looking at the angle 80 degrees again. So sine 80 degrees is equal to the perpendicular distance over the radius. Solving this, we get 0 0.2 multiplied by sine of 80 degrees is equal to the lever arm or the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the axis of rotation. So lastly, we can take our equation here and our newfound um, value for the lever arm or moment arm of 0 0.197 meters, and we can plug that in to this form of the torque equation, and solving, guess what we get? We get 3.9 Newton meters. So now you've used all three ways to calculate torque for this problem. A mechanic tightens the lugs on a tire by applying a torque of 110 Newtons at a 90 degree angle to the moment arm or lever arm. Those are synonymous. And in question four, I went over all of those details. So if you have not viewed question four, I want you to go back and view that, please. So here we have our force, and we're asked, what is the force? So we have our radial vector. We have our radius, with this being the axis of rotation. And so we're given that distance. And this particular force is at a 90 degree angle to the lever arm, to the axis or excuse me, to the radius. And so now we can simply take this formula for torque. We have the force, or excuse me, we're asked to find um, the force given the torque, 110 Newton meter torque, and we can set that equal to the force. We have the distance 0 0.4 meters. And of course, because this is at sine of 90 degrees, that's going to equal one, which will give us the maximum torque that this force can exert. Solving this for the force, we get 275 Newtons. Now in part B of this problem, you're asked, what is the minimum length of the wrench? If the mechanic is only able to apply a 200 Newton force. So this one is a little bit different. And we can take, we still need our torque. We have 110 Newton meters for the torque. And this time we're given the force. So the force is 200 Newtons and that's the maximum force that the mechanic can apply. And we're asked to solve for what is this um, minimum length. Okay. Cause that the longer that wrench, the more torque. All right. For a given force. So Let's use our equation here and solving for the radius, or in this case, the length of the wrench, which is the radius, we can get 0 0.55 meters. All right, so that is the minimum length that this wrench can be given the mechanic can only apply a 200 Newton force that must result in a 110 Newton meter torque. A constant force, F, is applied for five seconds at various points on this object as shown. Rank the magnitude of the torque exerted by the force on the object about an axle located at the center of mass. And we're going to do this ranking from smallest to largest. So um, really we can use a semi-quantitative approach to solve this problem. Um, let's go ahead conceptually and, and start talking about these uh, different forces. Let's go ahead and also underline circle, accentuate the use of the word magnitude. So we're the, the amount without reference to the direction. Let's look at B. Force B has zero torque. It has zero torque because R is zero. All right. So whatever force multiplied by zero, we're done. Because the distance from this force to the axis of rotation is zero. Okay. 
So next we can look at D. Let's go to the other extreme. Maximum torque. This is a maximum distance away, all right, from this axis. Now this axis of rotation is about let's, the center of mass of this, of this object. Now in upcoming problems, you're going to be asked to look at this as really a system of objects and look at parallel axes to mathematically calculate this. However, in this problem, we can say, all right, this distance over to here, this is maximum distance, R. So that's going to result in a maximum torque given these forces are all constant. Okay, let's look at C, very small. Why? Look at how far it is. Okay, relative to D, which was applied a greater distance. And mathematically, if we look at this and employ mathematical reasoning, you can see if the force is constant and radius goes up, torque goes up. All right, and that's all we're doing here. As radius increases, torque increases given a constant average force. All right, lastly, let's look at A. It has a large R, so that distance is large. However, the force is not applied. It's not all perpendicular, okay? So we have a perpendicular component, but we also have a component that's not doing any, um, cannot create any torque because of its angle here. So whether it's sine zero or sine 180, you're gonna get zero for that component. So only this component of force A is actually capable of doing torque. So we can look at these and go from smallest to largest. B is less than C, C is less than A, and D is the greatest of them all. A student pulls down on a small Atwood machine, named after the great physicist Charles Atwood. We're given the diameter, and let me go ahead and underline that because students will typically take that and plug it into the equation without reference to the fact that we need to divide it by two, let alone the fact that it's in centimeters, so we need to bump the decimal two spots to the left. Um, to get meters. So with a force of 30 newtons as shown in the diagram, what is the torque of this force? Okay, we have our go-to equation for torque. These uh, ropes on this Atwood machine are at a tangent, they're tangential, therefore they're at a 90 degree angle um, to the radius. And the radius, again, for divided by 2 is 2 divided by 100, 0 0.02 meters. Please don't forget to do that. And the way not to, to forget and have one of these careless mistakes is to underline it so that you remember as you're going through working out the problem. Torque, 0 0.6 Newton meters in this problem. A 15 kilogram box sits on a lever arm at a distance of five meters from the axis of rotation. What distance must a second 10 kilogram box sit to create a clockwise moment or rotation that will result in a net torque? In other words, the summations of the torque will equal zero. So in the first part of this problem, we're being asked to solve for the distance. So we don't know the distance. Where do we put this box to basically have the clockwise torque, which are the positive torque, the positive torque um, offset and balance the counterclockwise torque. So clockwise torque, counterclockwise torque. All right, remember the right-hand rule that we learned about in the previous unit here. If we look at the 15 kilogram box, all right, what is that box gonna do? Well, you have that box exerting a positive torque. 
okay? And a positive torque is counterclockwise. So if you use the right hand rule looking at the screen here, that's coming out towards you. The 10 kilogram box is going to be going into the screen. It will have a clockwise moment, which means it is exerting a negative torque. All right, so let's look mathematically at how we can do that. The sum of the torque must equal zero for this to be in, in basically what we will refer to as rotational equilibrium. The sum of the torque now we have our positive torque and we're gonna subtract our negative torque. So our positive torque exerted by the 15 kilogram crate times the acceleration due to gravity is where 150 newtons um, comes from. We're told its position relative to the axis. And then we have our 10 kilogram times 10, we get 100 newtons and that is multiplied by a distance that we're trying to solve for. And the, the, the condition for this equation is these two torques must equal zero. So let's go ahead and add the 100x to both sides so we can get it onto the, into, excuse me, get it onto the right side. And let's divide both sides by x to solve for r to be equal to 7.5 meters. So 7.5 meters is where we need to place this 10 kilogram box. So it needs to be placed over here and that will offset the torque exerted by the 15 kilogram crate where it will now be in rotational equilibrium. What would occur if the moment arm of the second box, which is also synonymous to the lever arm, of the second box was at eight. So it's further over to the right. What we found at 7.5, it would be in rotational equilibrium. If we bump it over another half a meter, then we will have this object will angularly accelerate. In other words, it will rotate. The direction it'll rotate is going to be right hand rule into the screen. That's a negative torque, therefore it will rotate clockwise, which is a, a, a negative angular acceleration, a, a negative um, angular velocity, as you learned in the previous unit. We have solved here for the overall torque to be negative 50 Newton meters. The system will rotate. It has a negative torque. It is not in rotational equilibrium. It will angularly accelerate however you want to conceptualize this because we found where that box belonged if we wanted the sum of torques to equal zero. And by moving it just a little bit over, that caused um, the system to rotate. Forces are applied along various points on a lever arm as shown. Calculate the net torque and describe the resulting motion of the lever. Determine the force and distance from the axis of rotation that would result in a net torque of zero. So in the second part of this problem, we're trying to find where the sum of these torques will equal zero, and thus this uh, system, this, this lever arm, will be in rotational equilibrium. Right hand rule, let's go through and look at each torque individually. Starting from the left, we see into the screen, that's a negative torque using the right hand rule. The next one, the five Newton force, that will exert a negative torque into the screen. The next one, five Newtons down onto the lever arm on the left side of the axis. That's going to lead out of the screen, which is a positive torque. That's our counterclockwise rotation. And lastly, we have our 10 Newton torque on the far right side of the lever arm. And that is going to result in a positive torque. Using the right hand rule, that's going to come out of the computer screen, out of your phone, at you. That is a positive counterclockwise torque. All right, now that we've conceptualized the problem a bit, let's go ahead and sum our torques. Let's take our two positive torques and subtract the negative torques to solve for the overall 
net torque being a negative 180 newton meters, which means that we will have a rotation that is clockwise. That's what that negative 180 newton meters is saying. So because of this, we get a negative torque, which is clockwise. And next, we want to find where we can get this into uh, a net torque of zero. And in order to do that, there are a number of ways you can do it. So, for example, just, uh, just one, uh, apply a positive torque of 180 newton meters. Um, and in other words, we could do 36 newtons at five meters counterclockwise to the right. We could also do 10 newtons at 18 meters counterclockwise, which would be on the left of the axis. Either way, you're going to be able to offset it. You just need to apply some sort of positive torque at 180 newton meters. You need somehow to get a counterclockwise rotation and torque of positive 180 newton meters, which would bring us to rotational equilibrium. A three kilogram academy sign is hung from a one kilogram four meter long horizontal pole as shown in this diagram. The sign is hung one meter from the right hand side. A wire is attached to prevent the sign from rotating. Find the tension in the wire. This problem starts a series of my some of my absolute favorite problems in physics referred to as equilibrium and more specifically static equilibrium in which the sum of the torque and the sum of the forces equal zero. So for the next several problems we're often going to be summing both the forces in the x and the y direction as well as summing the torque to solve the problem. So we're in static equilibrium here. Let's go ahead and get some of these forces labeled and, and think about these forces um, that are being exerted for this system of objects. So the 10 Newtons, where did that come from? That is the mass of the pull multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. And it is uh, assuming uniform mass density, so we will put that uh, at the center of mass of the pole. Then we have the academy sign, and that's exerting a 30 Newton force. And that's three kilograms multiplied by 10 meters per second per second. That's where 30 Newtons comes from. Next, we have a force of tension. And that force of tension will need to be resolved into X and Y components. We also have a hinge force at the wall where the pole is in contact with the wall. So this is a contact force. So we're going to choose an axis of rotation for these problems. So it, it, this would help if you say, what if this system were no longer in static equilibrium? Where would it rotate and how? And then you want to you wanna think about it a minute because you want to be smart about where you place that axis of rotation. We're going to put ours right smack on that wall. Want to know why? Because we are asked about the force of tension, and we don't know much about the force of the hinge that's occurring. We know that a component of that hinge force is up the wall, and a component of that hinge force is acting radially along the pole. Let's look at the right-hand rule and begin to look at the different torques that are exerted. Now remember, the sum of these torques will be equal to zero. So using the right-hand rule, we can go ahead and assign torques. We know that the academy sign, based on our axis of rotation, is going to have a negative torque, which means if you use the right-hand uh, rule, you're going into the screen, into the page, which means you're going to have a clockwise rotation, which is a negative torque. 
we know that the center of mass of the pole is also going to have a negative torque, right hand rule into the screen. If the system rotated um, we, from this torque, we would have a clockwise rotation. Then let's resolve our force of tension into the X and Y components. Let's look at the X component. The X component is, is acting radially. In other words, sine zero or sine 180 from the radial vector is going to give you sine is, is zero. So the X component of the force of tension and likewise the X component of the, the hinge force are unable to exert any torque. However, for the force of tension, the Y component does, exe does indeed exert a torque. And that torque is going to be positive. Think about it. Using the right-hand rule, that's going to spin counterclockwise. And the um, thumb points out of the computer screen, out of the phone, out of the page, out towards you, however you want to think about it. That's a positive torque. So now, let's go ahead and look at the condition for static equilibrium once more the sum of the torque the sum of the forces must equal zero which means we can finally sum the torque and we're going to take our positive torques and subtract our negative torques just as i've done here notice the trigonometry has been placed in where we have the force of tension that force of tension is going to be the resultant vector so here's the right triangle here, and we have a 30 degree angle here, which means we have a 60 degree angle here, a 30 degree angle here, because this is a, an isosceles right triangle. So the next thing we can do is um, look at our angle sine 30. Okay, well, if we look at this is what we're trying to find, well, that is opposite of this 30 degree angle. If you used cosine 60, that works as well. Um, however, that's where this value comes from. This is based on the trigonometry for the vertical component of the force of tension. Now, it is four meters out because that is the maximum distance from here all the way over to where that uh, force, that string, that rope, that cable is attached is four meters. Okay, now let's subtract the negative torques, and we have our 30 newton from the sine. Where is it at? Well, you're told in the problem it's one meter from the right side, which means from our axis of rotation all the way out to the academy sign is going to be three meters. Be careful with your distances. And then we have our center of mass, which is going to be two meters out from the axis of rotation. Okay, and we set all of that equal to zero. Now we're going to take that and we're going to rearrange this and solve for the unknown by dividing 110 newtons by two meters. Where did two meters come from? Sine of 30 degrees is 0 0.5 multiplied by four is where the two comes from. And we can get a force of tension. The resultant vector, the overall force of tension, 55 newtons. How did we do this? We did it using the conditions for static equilibrium for an extended object. Now, speaking of another static equilibrium problem, question 11 is a table problem. A table has an 18 kilogram object that is placed 0 0.8 meters from the left table leg. Okay, so this distance over to here is 0 0.8 meters. The mass of the tabletop is 6 kilograms. What is the force exerted on each leg? What would occur if the left leg broke? So, as I mentioned in question 10, and really for all of these static equilibrium problems, we're often going to sum the forces, uh, sum the forces uh, vertically and horizontally, along with summing the torque. Oftentimes, the answer is not quite clear until you get all of those summations completed. So, let's look at our table here, and let's start labeling 
these forces and conceptualizing these torques. So we have the center of mass. Well, the mass, 6 kilograms multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. Next, we have 18 multiplied by 10 gives you 180 newtons there. We also have an upward force exerted by the leg on the table. Okay? Then we also, on the far right side, have what I'm calling force normal 2, another force exerted by the leg on the right on the table. Notice the magnitude of that force is a little less than the magnitude of force normal 1, um, simply because we know the di where this object is positioned is further over to the left. So we would expect that to be an, a, a greater force there when compared to force normal 2. Now, summing the forces vertically, force normal 1 plus force normal 2, those are both up, let's call it positive, minus 180 newtons minus 60 newtons equals 0 because we are in static equilibrium. So let's place our axis of rotation over here for force normal 2. Now, you can put it on either side. It works out. Uh, you, you just you think about where you want to put it. Oftentimes, we'll place the axis of rotation. Again, that's what if this system, this object, angularly accelerated. What if the left leg broke? Well, if the left leg broke, then we would have an overall um, counterclockwise rotation if the left leg broke. So right hand rule coming out of the screen. Now let's sum the torque. And the torque distances will be relative to our chosen ax um, axis of rotation for this extended object in static equilibrium. So we have our 180. How far is it? Well, it's 3 meters minus 0 0.8 meters because our distances are measuring from here all the way over to the box. Now in the problem, don't just plug these numbers in. Think about where your axis is and where the object is relative to that axis. Okay, and then we have force normal two, which is uh, 60, or um, excuse me, plus 60 Newtons times 1.5, all right, minus force normal one multiplied by the distance there, okay? So we're subtracting that because the force normal one, if you think about it, guys, come on, it's going into the computer screen if you use the right-hand rule, which we've done in the last several problems. So um, positive torque, positive torque, positive torque, negative torque, if you think about it. And so that's why I've taken my positive torque, subtracted that one negative torque. And why did I neglect this guy over here? Because the distance is zero. So force two, given this scenario, is not going to exert a torque. That torque goes away. Now the force is still there, but the torque goes away. Back to our summation here. We're going to divide both sides now by three meters and solve for force normal one to be 162 newtons. Now, you always need to think about your answer. Is this reasonable? Is this reasonable? I mean, we have 180 newtons. We have of that, that box, that object. We have 60 newtons alone from the tabletop and we're being, we get an answer for force normal one of 162 newtons, and we know from our vertical summation that these two must equal the overall force. So let's revisit our vertical force summation. And now that we've solved for force normal one, and we know that the addition of one and two equals these two forces combined, 180 plus 60, that's my 240 newtons there. We know force normal one, so let's go and solve for force normal 2, and we find force normal 2 is 240 newtons, okay, based on this scenario. Therefore, 
force normal, and, and um, let me back up. I misspoke. The sum of the two would be 240 newtons. We know force normal one is 162 newtons. We found that by summing the torque. Now, using our vertical summation, we can solve for force normal two to be 78 newtons. Okay? And so, because of that, I can go back and revisit my, my force vectors here and say, does that make sense? Is force normal two less than force normal one? Yes, it makes sense. And they add to the overall negative forces exerted by the object and by the center of mass of the table. If the left leg broke, the system would rotate counterclockwise. The system would have a positive angular acceleration, a positive angular velocity, a positive overall net torque. A 50 kilogram box is hung from a five meter long 200 kilogram horizontal pole, as you can see here. A wire is attached to prevent the sign from rotating. Man, I love these problems. The box and wire attach at the right end of the pole as shown. You are asked to find the tension in the wire. We have an object, a system of objects that are in static equilibrium, which means the sum of the torque and the sum of the forces all equal zero. Let's start with our schematic and let's conceptualize this problem. We have a 2,000 Newton downward force at the center of mass of the horizontal pole. That's 200 kilograms multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. We have our 500 Newton force exerted at the far end of the pole, exerted by the 50, uh, ki 50 kilogram box that is hanging times the acceleration due to gravity. What else? We have a force of tension. And we're going to have to resolve that force and tension into X and Y components. We also have a contact force at the wall where the pole meets the wall. That is referred to as the hinge force. It too must be resolved into X and Y components. Let's choose the axis of rotation to be at this hinge force, at this contact point. Why? A couple reasons. One, we're asked to solve for the force of tension. Two, we don't know much else about what's going on for this hinge force. So it, it makes sense to go ahead and put our axis there. That way the torques, or excuse me, the torque exerted by this hinge force is zero. The force is still there, but it's no longer exerting a torque because the distance is zero. R equals zero, given that position for the axis of rotation. Let's go ahead and resolve the force of tension into the Y and into the X component. I want you to go ahead and think about the X and Y component. The X component is not going to exert a torque. Same with the X component of this guy over here. The torque here is going to be zero because these are acting at either a zero degrees or 180 degrees to the radial vector. And that will give you zero sine 180, zero sine zero, zero. So those components of these two forces are incapable of exerting torques. Let's look more at the geometry here of this and consider the right-hand rule. The vertical force tension will be capable of exerting a torque. And using the right-hand rule, we can look and assign values to this. So starting at the far right side, this vertical component is going to exert a positive torque. Using the right-hand rule, coming out of the screen, out of your paper, out of your phone, um, however you're, you're viewing this or working it out, that's going to be a counterclockwise rotation. The center of mass of the pole, that's a negative torque that's going into the screen. 
okay? That's a clockwise moment, a clockwise rotation. Same with the box. This box is exerting a negative torque. It's, it's good to do this, guys, so that when you actually go into your summation, you've already conceptualized this. You don't make any careless mistakes. You can take your positive torques and subtract your negative torques. Um, looking further at the geometry here and the trigonometry, here's what we have going on, and we have our angle here, which we're told is 30 degrees. And we want to solve for this um, component only. And sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse, which means we can find, um, using trigonometry, we can substitute in sine 30 into our torque equation. So we have the overall resultant vector, which is a force of tension, sine 30, which is 0 0.5, and that's going to multiply by that distance. Well, that distance from our chosen axis of rotation all the way out to where that force is exerted is 5 meters. Now let's subtract our negative torques. We have our 500 newton force. That's also 5 meters out. We have our 2,000 newton force, which is halfway out, 2.5 meters, and the condition for static equilibrium, the sum of the torques and the sum of the forces equals zero. So we set it equal to zero. Now mathematically, we can start to simplify this expression and therefore solve for the force of tension to be 7,500 newton meters divided by 2.5 meters, which is going to give us a force of tension of 300, or excuse me, three thousand newtons is the overall force of tension for um, this wire. All right, we've made it to question 13. This is one of my favorites. This is a ladder problem. And then if you enjoy these problems as much as I do, there's a couple ladder problems at the end of your problem set that are optional and just for fun. Let's get started on this. A five meter long, 200 Newton ladder rests against a wall. The ladder's center of mass is three meters up the ladder, so it's up here somewhere. The coefficient of friction on the ground is 0 0.3. That's mu, remember, that's dimensionless. How far along a ladder can a 75 kilogram person climb before it slips? And we're given the angle between the ladder and the ground to be 56 degrees. We're gonna zoom in and, and, and start labeling things here. This is a system in static equilibrium which means the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques all equal zero. So first force, 200 newtons. So this is a 20 kilogram ladder multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. And the center of mass for this given object is three meters up the ladder. So that's labeled accordingly. Next, our coefficient of friction. So we have friction on the ground. We know that because we're given a coefficient of friction to be 0 0.3. We have a 75 kilogram person in this problem. And we're saying how far up can he or she go before the ladder slips if it slips. Now, if it slips, we're no longer in static equilibrium. We have an object that is rotating. So that's our question we're trying to answer. 75 multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, 750 newtons. And I have put uh, this person there just because I'm not sure where else, but I do know that object is on the ladder and exerting some form of a torque. So our angle between the ground and the ladder is 56 degrees. We're getting everything laid out here. Now, the other thing we need to look at is these contact points here. So if a system is in static equilibrium, we know the forces and the torques equal zero. We have a contact force down at the floor here. This is 
perpendicular or normal to this object, okay? Normal to the ground, the force of the ladder system on the ground. So force normal one is directed straight up vertically. Force of friction, excuse me, force normal two, let's go up the wall. That is directed normal to at a 90 degrees, a contact force between the ladder and the surface here. So force normal two is directed straight away from the wall, normal to the wall, out to the left as relative for our, um, as we're viewing this, okay? Now, there's also a force of friction back down on the ground here. And the force of friction always opposes the direction of the motion. So in order to get this one um, conceptually correct up here, you have to think, okay, what would happen if the ladder slipped? What would happen if the ladder slipped? It would slide out like that, okay? So this, if it were to slip, the ladder would move this way. And the friction opposes that motion. So the friction is directed to the right, okay? Then we have a force of friction up the wall. Now, this force of friction up the wall is is um, something that we get to ignore for the most part in this problem because we have placed a piece there's an aluminum flashing there against the wall up up there on close to the chimney and so we can actually neglect the uh, force of friction up the wall because of this piece of aluminum flashing which is a good thing and again Let's do some other ladder problems in class, after school, those optional problems at the end of your problem set where we do not get to neglect the friction up the wall. I just want to make sure you understand that if it wasn't for this piece of aluminum flashing, which gives us a near frictionless environment, a mu approximately equal to zero, we would have to acknowledge this. Okay, enough of that. We have a lot going on here. So the next thing is going to be choosing an axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation is down here. Why does that make the most sense? There's two forces there. There's two forces at that point. By placing the axis of rotation there, I have now canceled those two torques because R, the distance from the force to the axis of rotation is zero and thus the torques for those two are zero. The forces are still there, but the torques go away and that's working smarter. Now, using our equations for torque, we've revisited the fact that there's three different ways in question four on this problem set, I went into some, some detail and I used all three of these to solve a simple torque problem. So for ladder problems, you're going to be using oftentimes the perpendicular component of the force and or the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the axis of rotation, i.e. the lever arm or moment arm. So let's go ahead and look at the perpendicular distance. On the schematic, it's going to be represented in blue from the line of action. Now recall what the line of action is. We're going to take a force and we're going to extend it in the direction of the force. Force normal two, we've taken that and extended it. Force normal one, or excuse me, the, the center of mass here of the ladder. We've taken that and we're going to extend it downward. What about where the, the person is, wherever that might be? Let's draw a line of action there as well. Okay, so we have line of actions drawn for force normal two, for the center of mass of the ladder, and for the person. <laughs> 
those are extended in the direction of the force all the way out like an imaginary line and this line of action is going to help you determine the perpendicular distance from that force to the axis of rotation in physics we call that distance the lever arm or moment arm let's look at it here for force normal two in blue the perpendicular distance from the force down to the axis of rotation is in blue that means we're going to be using trigonometry to solve take our force and multiply it by this perpendicular distance let's look at it here for force normal two in blue the perpendicular distance from the force so we're going to be using trigonometry to solve take our force and multiply it by this perpendicular distance let's look at it here for force normal two in blue the perpendicular distance from the force trigonometry to solve take our force and multiply it by this perpendicular distance let's look at it here for force normal two in blue the perpendicular distance from the force trigonometry to solve take our force and multiply it by this perpendicular distance in blue the perpendicular distance from the force trigonometry to solve take our force and multiply it by this perpendicular distance in blue the perpendicular distance from the force Trigonometry can't use the force to help us solve this problem. So this is very relevant. We can now look at our forces horizontal. Force of friction one is to the right. Force normal two to the left. So let's subtract our negative force from our positive force, calling right positive, left negative. Therefore, Adding force normal to, to both sides, we get that these are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. That means now we can use the physics is fun equation. It's been a while since we've gotten to use this. I love this. So the force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction mu multiplied by force normal. And that's exactly what we're doing here. And guess what? We know mu, and because we solved for the vertical forces, we now know force normal one, which means we can find the force of friction one by multiplying 0.3 times 950 newtons, and force of friction one is equal in magnitude opposite in direction to force normal two. And we can solve for that to find it to be 285 newtons. I told you I love these problems. Okay, now, taking what we know, we're, we're starting to get there. We're getting there. We have some information. Now let's conceptualize the torque. Force normal to at the wall, which is normal um, from the wall, 90 degrees from the wall. Right hand rule, that's going to give you a positive torque coming out at you a counterclockwise rotation your thumb is coming out of the screen out of the computer out of your page however you're doing this let's look at the center of mass for the ladder negative torque clockwise rotation let's look at where the individual wherever he or she might end up being regardless that individual will exert a negative torque all right so now we can sum the torque. However, as we're summing, this is the part where students make mistakes. 
We need to use the perpendicular distance, the lever arm, the moment arm. And I went over that earlier using the line of action for those three forces. We were able to look at the geometry. So revisiting that, the blue line, one, two, three, there's three of them. Those represent our perpendicular. So we have a 285 newtons, okay? Five meters, sine 56. All right, 285, look over here. 285 newtons, that's force normal too. All right, and we have our 56 here, alternate interior angles, so 56. We know this must be 34 and add to 90. And so sine, look here, 56, opposite, hypotenuse. What's the hypotenuse? It's the ladder. The length of the ladder is five meters. However, we want this side of the triangle. So we want this opposite. Sine theta is opposite divided by hypotenuse. So then if we take the hypotenuse and multiply both sides, we can isolate it. We have five meters, which is the hypotenuse. Sine 56 will give you this perpendicular distance here. Now you could also use cosine 34. All right, so that's our positive torque. Now let's subtract our negative torques using the perpendicular distances. Please think about this. Come to me with questions. Pause the video. But this is really cool stuff. So we have the force exerted by the center of mass of the ladder. Then we have 3 meters, cosine 56. Okay, so um, cosine 56 well, this is our angle here, theta, and it's 56. And these, both of these, for that matter, are adjacent to that angle 56. Both of these blue dashed lines, which represent the lever arm for both of the forces, the force of the center of mass and the force of the person. We can use cosine 56. You could also use sine 34. That's up to you. It'll give you the same answer. The other common mistake here is this distance, this hypotenuse for this triangle is three meters. Make sure you're using that. So three meters cosine 56 degrees is the perpendicular distance, is the lever arm, is the moment arm for the force of the center of mass. Now let's do that lastly for the person, except in this case, we're going to put in X meters because we don't know. You, you, you may have forgotten this problem has been so long, but we're trying to find out how far along the ladder can this person go before it slips, okay? So we have our X variable in red and 750 newtons is the force exerted downward by a 75 kilogram person and using the exact same logic here, cosine 56 degrees gives us this lever arm or moment arm, okay? And a condition of static equilibrium that must all equal zero. We're getting close, guys. We're getting so close. So let's clean this up a little bit. Grab your calculator, plug this in, clean it up. Um, multiply out the trig and you're going to get this which we can then start dividing both sides um, by the 750 newtons don't forget the cosine 56 as well and now we can solve for x we can finally find the position how far along can this person go the answer two meters this person goes any higher than two meters, this system will angularly accelerate. It will rotate. It will slip.
it will end up having a negative angular acceleration, a negative angular velocity, okay? It will end up having an overall clockwise rotation, a clockwise moment, however you want to describe it. But anything less than two in this person is okay. Question 14. Let's look at this diagram of a bear on a pole. And we have a string, and the string can only hold a maximum of 900 newtons. Can the bear reach this 80 newton basket of food without the string breaking? The total distance out to that food is 6 meters. Guys, we have another static equilibrium problem. I love these. And so static equilibrium means the sum of the torque, the sum of the forces are equal to zero. We have an extended object. We have a system of objects. We're told the maximum amount of tension in the string is 900 newtons. Anything more? String breaks and the system accelerates, angularly accelerates. It rotates. It's no longer in equilibrium. So let's go ahead and label these forces. Let's start with our force of tension. So we have a force of tension here um, acting, and we have uh, an X and a Y component. Again, the X component will not exert a torque, and the reason for that is because if you look at the angle between the force and the radial vector, you're going to get either 180 degrees or uh, zero degrees, both of which give you a sine of zero, sine 180 equal to zero. So the horizontal portion of this tension force will not exert a torque. The force is still there. Okay, and let's go ahead and place our axis of rotation over here against the wall. Um, or, or whatever against the tree, whatever this object is, where we have our hinge forces, our contact forces acting vertically and horizontally as well. And we know nothing about those forces other than they exist. So we're going to go ahead and place our axis of rotation there for the simple fact we don't know enough about those forces, and there's two forces there. So if we place the axis of rotation there, if the system accelerated, then those torques would go away because the distance, R, would be equal to zero. Thus, torques would be equal to zero. Furthermore, we're asked about and given information about the force of tension. So... That makes the most sense to go ahead and put our axis at that point for those numerous reasons. Let's sum the forces vertically. Why? Because it's good practice to sum forces and sum torque for static equilibrium pro problems. Always, because oftentimes the answer or the methodology will become clear as you're summing. Think about what we did in the last ladder problem when we were solving for the force of friction using the coefficient of friction and we summed the vertical forces, found force normal, and that enabled us to find the force of friction and ultimately solve that problem. All right, back to our little bear here. Um, so we know that the vertical component of this contact force here plus the vertical component of the force of tension must equal 980 newtons. So that's good to know. Let's do the same horizontally. Let's call to the right positive to the left negative. So this contact force R sub X minus the horizontal component of the force of tension, capital T sub X, equals zero which tells us they are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So, um, you know, might prove useful. Moving on, let's conceptualize our torques. Let's use the right-hand rule to look at the torques. So starting at the force of tension, that vertical component, T sub Y, is exerting a positive torque. The downward force exerted by the basket of food is exerting a negative torque. Use the right-hand rule. 
the center of mass of this pole is exerting a negative torque as well. So that 200 newtons is exerting a negative torque. And the bear is also exerting negative torque. So we have three negative torques and we have one positive torque. When we're summing, we're gonna first look at this component here because we're about to put in the trigonometry. So I want you to know where it comes from. This angle here is 30 degrees and we are interested in this adjacent side. So, um, and as always with any of these, you could, you could use cosine of 30, you could use sine uh, uh, of 60, that's up to you how you wanna do that. In this problem here, I have cosine of 30 degrees. So that 30 degrees is, again, the adjacent side. And look at my length here, please from the axis of rotation all the way out to that torque that's six meters that's the full distance out to the food okay so we can now subtract our negative torques the food basket is also six meters out the center of mass is halfway out three meters out and the bear 700 newtons it's a 70 kilogram bear but we don't know how far that's what we're trying to say can the little bear reach the food can the bear get all the way out there let's call that x and find out if this bear can get all the way out given these forces and the resulting torques solving this expression dividing both sides by 700 newtons we can find the position, the distance, to be 5.1 meters. So our bear falls safely to the ground. The bear does not get to reach the goodie basket because the bear can only get out to about here before the system angularly accelerates, before it rotates and is no longer in static equilibrium. An object with uniform mass density is rotated about an axis. This axis is at varying positions, A, B, C, D, as shown on this diagram. You're being asked to rank the object's rotational inertia from smallest to largest based on those positions. So on your problem set, you have values for uh, several objects for the rotational inertia. Um, please remember a synonym for this would be the moment of inertia. However, College Board claims they will only use rotational inertia based on the College Board description. So I will consistently use rotational inertia rather than moment of inertia for that reason However, I want you to know both terms. So let's look at these various rotational inertias. These are derived using calculus. You will be given these values in a problem. If you are not given these values in a problem, you will use the rotational inertia for a point mass or a particle, okay? For this problem here, we can use um, basically uh, ML squared because this is not involved. We don't have any mathematical computations here because if we wanted to get technical, this is a system of rods located about parallel axes. Now we'll get technical later in the problem set, but for now, let's keep it simple because we're just starting to look at rotational inertia. So let's look at C here. We have a rotation, uh, and this rotation is, I think you can look at this object and say it's at the center of this object, okay? So the, the distance, it's all, please look, it's all about this distance. Mass, uniform mass density, that's gonna stay the same. And so as this distance L increases, this um, rotational inertia or resistance to angularly accelerate will also increase. So the rotational inertia in this case is directly proportional to the square of the distance. Um, 
and that's getting more technical than we need to for this ranking task. C is minimal. B, so we have a larger L from here. It's, it's a larger L. So think about this point here. Think about this object rotating. All right, you've got all of this mass going all the way out to here, and then you have this mass on this side as well. Now look at D. Think about if it were here. If it were here, we would see an even greater rotational inertia at that point. What about if it were all the way out here? Position A, L gets even bigger. What do we know? The mass is the same. So all we're looking at, guys, here is this distance, L. And we're looking at, starting with C, L gets a little bigger, L gets even bigger, and A, L is largest. And the rotational inertia is increasing as that distance increases. All right, so for our ranking task, we have C is less than B, less than D, less than A. And we have several problems where we're going to look at this mathematically as well. Question 16. Find the rotational inertia of a two uh, point masses. We, so we have two and they're connected by a one meter rod of negligible mass. So we're going to neglect any mass uh, of the rod, therefore we're going to neglect any rotational inertia there. Um, and we're going to look at when it is rotated about the center of the rod first. We're then going to compare that to when it's rotated um, about one of the masses. Let's start with the center. So the axis of rotation is placed directly in the center of mass of the um, two-point mass system. Looking at the rotational inertia, we can say that it is equal to the sum of the individual rotational inertias. So in some of the more complex problem, we're going to be summing rotational inertia for a system of, of rods, for a system of point masses. Um, but for now, we can simply plug in our mass, plug in our distance, square it, and add both of them together. Let me look at each one individually. The mass for each is five, so there's the mass. The distance from the axis of rotation to each mass is one half of a meter, and that's squared. So we're not worried about um, signage here because this is squared, it's not a big deal. And so even though this is to the left, again, not a big deal. So we're gonna add it. So this mass plus this mass times S distance squared is going to give me the rotational inertia of this two-point mass system is equal to 2.5 kilogram meters squared. Okay? Now, what if we rotate this about another axis, and that axis is right in the middle of one of the masses? I want you to think about it, guys. Do you believe the rotational inertia, the resistance to angularly accelerate, to rotate, is going to be greater in this second scenario than it was in the first scenario based on our discussion from the previous problem? Let's mathematically look at this. We have here our same rotational. We have point masses, so we're using mr squared, and we have two of them, so we're going to be summing them. Let's start by looking at this first mass all the way over to here. That's one full meter. That's the full length of the rod, and we're squaring it. What about this one? Zero. Why? What's the distance from this mass to the, the axis of rotation? Zero. The, zero the, the distance is zero, so R is zero. Therefore, this there is no rotational inertia from this guy over here. It's canceled out because the axis of rotation is there. Mathematically, we can solve this and find that the rotational inertia is double what it was in the first scenario of this problem.
Question 17. What is the angular acceleration experienced by a uniform solid disk of mass 2 kilograms and radius 0 0.1 meter? I'm going to underline disk. When a net torque of 10 newton meters is applied, assume the disk spins about its center. All right. So Newton's the angular analog of Newton's second law states that the sum of torque is equal to the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. We have values here. We know the net torque. We're told the net torque is a positive 10 Newton meters. Now we need to look at our rotational inertia for a solid disk. Find it on your problem set here. Recall these values will be given to you in the problem. These are derived using calculus. If they're not given to you in the problem, it's a safe bet you're using the rotational inertia for a point mass. However, in this case here, we have our value to be 1 half mr squared for a solid disk rotated about its center. So, 1 12th, 2 is the mass of the disk. The overall radius of this disk is given to you as 1 10th of a meter, and that is squared. Multiplied by the angular acceleration, algebraically we can manipulate this, divide the 10 newton meters by the 1 half times 2 times 0 0.1, and that's going to give us an angular acceleration of positive 1,000 radians per second per second. Next, we can um, look at question 18. Given the net torque of this system, find the angular acceleration for the system of these three point or particle masses. So we're going to be using mr squared to find the rotational inertia for each mass individually. The radius from the rotation of the um, of axis is 12 meters, and we're told these masses are equidistant, so they're they're all going to be four meters apart from each other. Assuming a constant angular acceleration, what would the angular velocity be after five seconds? How many revolutions would be completed after 20 seconds with that constant acceleration? First things first, otherwise you'll get bogged down on this problem. First things first. We need to look at the angular acceleration. Okay, so let's start off by finding the overall sum of the rotational inertia. In this case here, as I alluded to in previous problems, now we have a system of objects and in, their sim in, in its simplest form, we have a system of, of particle masses. So this is fairly straightforward. We're going to do this by looking at each one individually and taking the mass of each particle and the distance squared for each particle. And that distance is from the axis of rotation. So the rotational inertia of the system we have our 1 kilogram, 2 kilogram, and 5 kilogram masses, respectively. That's going from the outer edge, working our way inward. We have these distances. All the way out is a 12 meter distance. So for this little mass, relatively speaking, it is 12 meters out, and that distance is squared. Then we have our 2 meter, or excuse me, our 2 kilogram mass, and it must be eight meters out because they are equidistant. So they're each four meters all the way out to 12. Lastly, our five kilogram mass here, and it is four meters out squared. So summing the rotational inertia, or as some refer to it, the moment of inertia for this system is 352 kilogram meters squared. Okay. So now we've found the rotational inertia of the system. Now we can look at the net torque 
exerted. We have two forces here. And these forces are at 90 degrees to the radial vector, which means sine 90 is 1. So we can simply look at these two forces and their torques. Let's look at signage. The outermost 15 Newton force is going to result in a positive torque or a counterclockwise rotation. The other force of 70 Newtons is a negative clockwise torque or clockwise moment as it is often called. All right. Now we can use and, and, and look at Newton's um, rotational analog. This is the angular analog to Newton's second law, which states the sum of the torques is equal to, in this case, the rotational inertia of the system multiplied by the angular acceleration. Let's sum the torque. We have our 15 Newton torque, and it's 12 meters out, and we're going to subtract the negative torque exerted by the 70 Newton force, which is 8 meters out from the axis of rotation, and that quantity is equal to the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration, which means since we found the angular excuse me, since we found the rotational inertia for the system earlier in the problem to be 352 kilograms multiplied by meters squared, we can plug that in. We have negative 380 newton meters is equal to that inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration, which means we can now divide both sides by the rotational inertia of the system and find the angular acceleration to be equal to a negative 1.1 radians per second per second. So that means that this system of particle masses is going to have a clockwise rotation. It's going to have a negative angular velocity, negative angular acceleration, moving clockwise. Next, we can answer the part of this problem saying, what is the angular velocity after five seconds? So now you need to recall angular velocity. Angular velocity. We can find the angular velocity by using what we know. And we know the angular acceleration. And we know angular acceleration is equal to a change in the angular velocity. So omega final minus omega naught divided by that change in time. And if we start from rest, then we can simply plug in numbers here. Multiply the angular acceleration that we found in the first part of the problem by the duration of time, five seconds. That's going to give us the resulting angular velocity. And so Omega is going to equal negative 5.5 radians per second. That is the angular velocity at that moment, five seconds after the net torque was exerted. Lastly, how many revolutions will be completed after 20 seconds? So now we're looking at after an entire delta T, 20 seconds, how many revolutions will this system of three particle masses have completed? So let's use one of our rotational UAM equations here. Let's use that our angle theta is equal to the initial angular velocity multiplied by time plus one half the angular acceleration multiplied by time squared. Well, we started off with zero angular velocity, so this piece of the equation will go away. And we solved for this in the very first part of the problem. And now we're taking our time and squaring it to solve for the angular distance, which is in radians. So theta is equal to 220 radians. This problem is saying how many revolutions. So now we need to do one step further and use dimensional analysis to convert 220 radians 
into revolutions. So we're going to simply say there are two pi radians in one revolution. So we're going to divide 220 by the quantity two pi to get 35 revolutions are completed after 20 seconds given this net torque on this system of three particle masses. So cool. Question 19. What is the rotational inertia of the disk shown with the radius, four meters, and a mass of two kilograms? The same disk is rotated around an axis that is 0 0.5 meters from the center of mass of the disk. What is the new rotational inertia? What would be the rotational inertia 3.75 meters out from the center? Let's get started on this problem, which is the first one in which you will be using the parallel axis theorem. First, let's look at our rotational inertia or moment of inertia. Let's revisit some of our most common rotational inertias derived through calculus, which will always be given to you on a problem on the exam, and if not, you're going to use mr squared for a point particle point mass. However, this is clearly a disk, you are told that, and so we're going to be using the rotational inertia for a disk, one half mr squared. So, we are told the mass of the disk and we're gonna be manipulating the distance r throughout. Notice that the rotational inertia is directly proportional to the radius and that radius is squared. Okay, so at this center, we can easily solve for this by plugging in these values with the radius and the radius is four meters. From here, all the way out, capital R equals four meters. That's a plug and chug. We can get an answer of 16 kilograms times meters squared. Now that is the rotational inertia for this disc rotated about its center. However, this problem goes on and asks us, what about the rotational inertia a half a meter out from the center? Pause the video and think about it. We've seen this in several problems. Now we're moving further out. And we saw that the rotational inertia increased. Now we're using mathematics to show that and actually calculate it using the parallel axis theorem, which states that the rotational inertia about the parallel axis is equal to the rotational inertia at the center of mass plus the mass and that distance to the parallel axis squared. We're adding this whole piece to the rotational inertia about the center of mass, which we found for this problem to be 16 kilograms per meter squared. So this will increase. So mathematically now, we can quantify it using parallel axis theorem. So we have what we calculated in part one, and now we're adding the mass times the distance to that parallel axis squared. The distance is 0 0.5, we're gonna square it, which is gonna give us 0 0.25 multiplied by two. We're adding another half, so our rotational inertia is 16.5 kilograms times meters squared. So as we predicted, rotational inertia about this parallel axis has indeed increased. Now what if we go all the way, like way out here, 3.75 meters out from the center? Let's make a bold prediction. The rotational inertia is going to be much greater than 16 kilograms times meters squared. And let's quantify that using the parallel axis theorem and our distance now 3.75 and that distance is squared. We're gonna get a final rotational inertia of 44 kilograms times meters squared, 
for this parallel axis. Question 20. A rod of uniform mass density and length, 2 meters, is rotated about an axis that is 0 0.5 meters from the center of mass. The rod's mass is 2 kilograms. What is the rotational inertia of this rod about this parallel axis? Using your values that you have on the problem set and that will be given to you on the exam, you can find a rod here. And we're looking at a rod that is being rotated not at the center, but at an axis parallel to the center. So we can start off using 1 12th ml squared, where L is the distance. And again, that distance is squared. So we can see that the rotational inertia is proportional to the square of the distance. All right, so we're given that the parallel axis, and we're of course gonna be using the parallel axis theorem in this particular problem. Let's calculate the rotational inertia for the, this object about its center of mass, and it's 0 0.67 kilograms times meters squared. Now let's use the parallel axis theorem and take it one step further. Make a prediction based on what we've seen throughout the problem set one would predict that the rotational inertia about this parallel axis will be greater than it is at its center of mass. Let's quantify that using parallel axis theorem. And the value we calculated in the first part, except this time we're adding the mass times the distance to that parallel axis, and that distance is squared. Okay. So we're going to be adding that value to what we calculated to get a final answer of 1.2 kilograms times meters squared for this rod rotated about a parallel axis. All right, in question 21, we have four identical objects as shown in the diagram A through D. You're told that these are rods, um, rotated about varying axes. Um, the axes are either at one end of the rod or in the center of the rod, and the rods are all equal length and equal masses. So you are ultimately asked to derive expressions in terms of M, the mass, and L, the length, in order to rank these objects according to their rotational inertia. So, Let's go ahead and look at the rotational inertia for a rod rotated about its center versus a rod rotated at one end or the other. So we have 1 12th ml squared when rotated about the center, and then we have 1 3rd ml squared when rotated about one end. So we're going to be using these throughout this problem to help us rank rotational inertia from largest to the smallest. Additionally, we're going to apply the parallel axis theorem to help us in our ranking. So let's start with figures A and B. So the axes are perpendicular to the plane of the object. And looking at A, you can see that it is right in the middle of one of the rods. So let's look at that first. We have a distance to this rod here, and that's the way you really need to conceptualize this problem. I see one rod here, and then at this far end, I see another rod here. Okay, so in the distance is going to be one half of the length over to this, uh, this second rod. So that's one way that you can really look at this problem. Same with B. We have a rod rotated about the center, and then at a distance of one half the length of the rod, we have another rod uh, rotating. So these are going to be the same. Let's go ahead and derive some expressions for these. So for object A, we have 1 12th ml squared, which is for this rod here rotated about the center plus 
we have this rod here. Now think of this as this rod is, is attached there. So it is actually rotating on its end, which is one third ML squared. Then we are adding the distance to this parallel axis and we're squaring it. So the distance is one half L, which is where this term comes from here and it is squared. And the mass of this uh, object here is simply m, so we're adding that uh, along with its distance squared. So one more time, the best way to think of these is as the, the problem states, these are two rods. Look at them individually, starting at the axis, and then look at the second rod and where it is being rotated as well as the distance over to that rod. Let's look at um, actually quantifying this. So adding these fractions up and looking at this expression here, one half L squared, okay? So that's one half squared, which is one quarter. And by adding these fractions in the denominator, we're gonna make them all 12 which allows us to add them up and, and quantify them. Let's look at B, which is going to be identical to what we saw in A. We're going to have the, the denominator be 12. We're going to add them all up just like we did in A. And A and B are therefore equal to 8 twelfths ml squared. So this is just one way that you can use a semi-quantitative approach that we can derive some sort of expression and note that our derivation, our expression rather, is in terms of M and L as stipulated in the problem. Now let's look at C and D. Let's start with C. We have a rod at one end. So you should be thinking one third ML squared right now. And then a full length down, we have another rod, and it is, is being rotated at one end. So you should be thinking one-third ml squared again. And the full distance to the parallel axis is the full length of the rod as compared to A and B, where it was L over 2 or one-half L. So we have one-third ml squared for rod 1 plus one third ml squared for rod two. And the distance to that parallel axis is the full length squared and the mass is M. So this allows us again to be consistent with what we did in A and B in the denominator. Let's add these up, have them equal to 12. That way we can compare A and B to C and D and we get 20 over 12 ml squared for the rotational inertia of C. Let's look at D. We have one third ml squared, one third ml squared, and we have no um, distance to the parallel axis. So there's no parallel axis, they share this axis. So we're simply one third ml squared plus one third ml squared which is going to give us in terms of 12, 8 twelfths ml squared. So now it becomes easy to see for our ranking task from largest to smallest that C is greater than A, which is equal to B and equal to D. Question number 22, we have a light string attached to a mass M. It's wrapped around a pulley of mass M sub P and radius R. If the rotational inertia of the pulley is one half M P R squared, derive an expression for the acceleration of the mass in terms of the mass of the object, the mass of the pulley, and any other fundamental constants. You're given the rotational inertia for the pulley, again, is one half MPR squared. So that is given to you in the problem. Let's look at um, our free body diagram over here on the hanging mass. We have a force of tension upward. We have the force of gravity downward. 
Um, so we can sum the forces vertically here, um, as, as we always do. And um, uh, calling down positive, we have mass times the acceleration due to gravity minus the force of tension. That is going to equal mass times the vertical acceleration. Then it should be fairly obvious here that we're, we're looking at incorporating the equation for torque. Well, what's causing the torque would be the force of tension. Force of tension is tangential to the pulley, and thus we have our um, sine 90 degrees, which is 1, so we don't have to worry about it. We have maximum torque exerted given this force of tension. So... For the sum of the torque, we have force of tension times that uh, the radius there, and that's going to be equal to the rotational inertia of the pulley, which we're given, and the um, angular acceleration. Okay, so let's move on. Looking at our sum of torque, now let's plug in for the rotational inertia. Let's go ahead and plug in the value um, given to you two times in this problem and we have such, and then we can divide both sides by the radius, which allows us to get rid of the radius on the left, although we still have radius on the right, it's no longer squared. So simplifying that a bit further, we have the radius uh, multiplied by the angular acceleration. Well, one thing that we've done in previous units and I've implored you to do throughout is consider the rotational and translational analogs here. So in this case here, the tangential acceleration is equal to the radius multiplied by the angular acceleration. Remember that equation that allows us to go between angular and translational. All right, so we're going to use this here to help us simplify the problem. So now we have a, an expression, and we we no longer have the angular acceleration, which is good, given we were told to derive an expression for the tangential acceleration of the mass, the translational acceleration of the mass, whatever you want to call it. So we needed to somehow convert from the angular acceleration into the um, translational acceleration. We have now done that. So the next step is going to be to consider our summation in the y once again. We have mass gravity uh, multiply or subtract the force of tension, and that's going to give us the mass times that acceleration that we're trying to solve for. Therefore, the um, mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and if we subtract that from both sides and plug it in, look what we get. We get that the mass gravity is equal to m times that acceleration plus this piece here. So what have we done? We've taken our force of tension and the force of tension here, and we've put it in terms of the torque. So in terms of the torque, meaning this here, all right, which we solved for up here and ultimately derived here for the force of tension. So in terms of the force of tension, we've taken that and plugged it in right here. And we've added that to both sides, rather. I believe I misspoke earlier. We've added that to both sides. And that has allowed us to arrive at this. Now, at this point here, you may be tempted to start canceling out masses, but you cannot. Remember, we have the mass of the pulley and the mass of the um, hanging mass in this case. So we can't just start canceling them out, which is why it's very important to maintain your subscripts throughout, have everything labeled very well. So mass times the acceleration due to gravity is equal to, well, let's factor out and isolate the tangential acceleration. So here I have factored out the tangential acceleration, and now it becomes fairly obvious that the derived expression for the acceleration of the mass is going to be the mass of the hanging mass multiplied by a fundamental constant, 
which is the acceleration due to gravity, and that quantity divided by the sum of the hanging mass plus one half the mass of the pulley. And that is our final derivation. And it is in terms of mass of the hanging mass, mass of the pulley, and a fundamental constant, i.e. the acceleration due to gravity. Question 23, a merry-go-round on a playground with a rotational inertia of 100 kilograms times meters squared starts at rest. You know I'm going to underline that, and you should be doing the same thing is accelerated by a force of 150 newtons at a radius of one meter from the center. Okay, if this force is applied at an angle of 90 degrees, in other words, it's tangential to the radial vector, then, and it's applied for a duration of half a second, what is the final rotational velocity? of the merry-go-round. So we're trying to find omega final. So given what we have here, we're going to lay it all out like we always do. We have a mixture of some of those uh, rotational uh, UCM variables, but we also have some torque going on here. So we're going to just lay it all out, try to come up with a plan for this problem here. We uh, can sum our torque here, which is very simple, and set that equal to the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. So, of course, this is the rotational analog of Newton's second law here. And our force, 150 Newtons. It's at 1 meter. Sine 90 is 1, so it's the, the full torque given a force of 150 Newtons. And so that allows us to look at solving for the angular acceleration. Angular acceleration, omega final minus omega initial divided by the change in time. Well, we started at rest here. So because we started at rest, we can say omega final minus zero or just disregard it altogether. And we can then multiply both sides by 0 0.5 seconds to solve for the final angular velocity of 0 0.75 radians per second. Okay, 0 0.75 radians per second. And looking at this diagram, the torque is going to result in a clockwise rotation and therefore, omega final, the actual vector quantity is going to be negative 0.75. Per the right-hand rule, it's going to be directed into the page, into the computer screen, which is a, a, a negative angular velocity for this problem. Now, there is an alternative solution to this problem. Little later on in the problem set, in effect, you're going to be asked to come back to this question and consider solving it using the angular momentum and the angular impulse. So, angular impulse is anytime you have a torque in an amount of time that torque is exerted, you should be thinking about angular impulse. You should be thinking about the change in angular momentum being equal to a torque multiplied by a duration of time. You can use angular impulse to solve this problem. If we take our torque and multiply it by half a second, the amount of time that torque was applied, then we get the change in angular momentum is equal to 75 Newton meter seconds. Well, that is equal to omega, um, excuse me, the uh, final angular momentum. Where did the initial angular momentum go? It's zero. Remember, it started at rest. So I've just disregarded that. So omega final minus omega naught, or the final momentum minus the initial momentum, that's just going to be what we had for the final, which is what we're trying to solve for. So dividing both sides here by 100, which is the rotational inertia for this merry-go-round, we get the exact same answer. And again, 
Given this schematic, that would be a negative 0.75 radians per second. Pretty cool stuff. In question 24, we have three one meter long bars of uniform mass density, and they each have a mass, a 200 gram mass, um, as you can see in A, B, and C. All right, a person is gripping the bars and locations shown and attempts to rotate the bars in the directions shown. Calculate the rotational inertia for each bar. Now, in class, I have several torque sticks, what I call them, in the front of the classroom for you to come up and, and actually go ahead and, and solve this problem in class using the torque sticks. Um, and, and get a feel for it. It's really cool stuff. So let's go ahead and calculate rotational inertia. And so we have a, a point mass, that's the 200 gram mass, that's uh, a rotational inertia is equal to mass times the distance, the radius squared. And then we have bars. These bars are rods essentially, and if they're gripped at one far end, then that would be one third ml squared. If they are gripped in the center, then that would be one twelfth ml squared. So let's do this. For the, the bar mass system, which is shown in A, the person is holding that at the point mass, so at that 200 gram mass. So if we quantify this, we have one third, because it's at one extreme end of the bar or rod, that's where the one third is coming from. And then the uh, length of that particular bar, which is one meter, plus the point mass. Well, what's the distance to the point mass? Zero, because that is the axis of rotation. That's where the person's holding it. So this whole piece goes away because the individual is holding it at the mass. The distance there is zero. And again, grab a torque stick in the front of the classroom and try this out. It's really cool. So if we're looking for a number, we get 0 0.07 kilograms times meters squared for the uh, rotational inertia of this bar mass system. B, let's use the same approach. Except this time, look, we're going to use 1 12th because the individual is holding it in the center of the bar or rod. And then we're going to be adding this additional mass. Well, what's the distance to that mass? Again, the distance is zero. So we are going to completely neglect that 200 gram mass in this case, again, just as we did in A. And for our number, we get 0.02 kilograms times meters squared. Now, let's look at C. C, we're holding it at one end of the bar. So we are back looking at one third ml squared. And we have this distance all the way to the point mass here. So this time, we are going to factor in the rotational inertia of the point mass and we're going to add these two together for the system to get 0 0.27 kilograms times meters squared. And when you check this out in class, you'll see that torque stick C is much harder to, to rotate than the other configurations. Okay? Therefore, our final ranking C is greater than A is greater than B. Question 25, we have a weight tied to a rope wrapped around a pulley. The pulley is initially rotating counterclockwise. I think it's important here. I want to kind of show that here. So we have some initial rotation here counterclockwise. And that's going to be in the positive direction. The direction of the vector is out of the page, out of the screen toward you. It is pulling a weight up, so we have a weight attached here, and it is pulling that weight up. Okay, the tension in the rope creates a torque and um, is going to clearly oppose that motion. So in A, on the axes below, 
draw a graph of the angular velocity versus time for the period from the initial instant shown, um, as I've shown here in the diagram, until the weight comes back down to the same height. Okay, guys, let's think about this. It's initially rotating with a positive angular acceleration. There's a mass exerting a torque, and that's opposing the motion. That mass is go going to go up until it stops, okay? And then it's going to reverse and start coming back down this way. All right, I hope that makes sense. So let's look at what that would be like on a graph. We have some positive initial angular velocity. At some point, this stops rotating. So the angular velocity equals zero at some point, and then it changes direction and goes in the opposite direction. In this case, clockwise. Clockwise is a negative angular velocity. So we're going to start here, we're going to cross the origin somewhere, and we're going to end somewhere um, with a negative angular velocity. Okay, so graphically this would look like such. And if we consider now the angular Acceleration for part B, look at the slope. It doesn't matter where you find the, the slope. It is a constant slope. Therefore, the rate, the change in omega over change in time is constant. And that's going to give you your acceleration here, which is going to be constant and negative. Question 26 an angler is balancing a fishing rod on her finger as shown. If she were to cut the rod along the dashed line, um, which is indicated here, would the weight of the piece on the left side be greater than, less than, or equal to the rate, weight excuse me, of the piece on the right-hand side? And we're going to use a semi-quantitative approach, a mixture of qualitative and quantitative reasoning to solve this problem. This object, this fishing rod, is in rotational equilibrium. So that means the sum of torques on this rod must equal zero. Let's go ahead and do some sort of free body diagram to help us uh, conceptualize the problem. So on the left side, we have a, the force of gravity exerting a torque. And of course, that torque is, and excuse me, that force is at a 90 degree angle to the radial vector, sine 91. So we're not gonna worry about any of the trigonometry. Let's look at the right side here. Uh, the, the approximate location there would be um, somewhere around here for the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. I've used different variables to indicate the different masses, and here's why. Let's look at the radius here. So if we look at the radius to the left side, it's very small. If we look at the radius to the right side, it's relatively large. If we look at this from a pure torque perspective and go ahead and look at it full quantitative approach where the sum of the torque must equal zero. The torque on the left side of the finger is a positive torque. Um, the torque on the right side is a negative torque. So if we go ahead and add the right side torque to both sides, we can get our expression here. And then we can look at this and answer the question. So the, the center of mass is so much further away on the right side. So look at this, guys. If these are equal and this is much greater than this is small, then this must be 
um, excuse me, then this must be much greater. All right. Question 27. This is another video analysis question. Go to petersonscience.com, unit six, and view the video um, of a wheel being accelerated by a falling mass. You are asked to calculate the angular acceleration of the wheel and neglect any frictional forces that may be occurring. So after viewing the video several times, I have chosen to start at uh, frames plus 80 frames into the video. I chose this uh, particular instant because I have my yellow dot right here at a starting point, and it was the moment, the instant that this person cut the string. That's when I chose to start my analysis. Next, I looked at this plus 306 frames. So I went from 80 frames to 306 frames. I chose this location because now look at the position of the yellow dot. So it has moved a total of 180 degrees. It has moved pi radians. It has moved 0 0.5 revolutions. And I like that as a stopping point for my analysis. So now we can look and see here before and after we can go through and analyze our frames. So we had 226 frames elapse in this video from 306 minus 80, and we know that it was shot at 240 frames per second. So now we can get the number of seconds that went by. Using dimensional analysis, we get 0 0.94 seconds for the amount of time, or delta T. Now we can use a um, uniform circular motion equation and look at... Um, putting in our values for theta. Remember, it started at rest, which is nice. And so this is going to be a good approach for us to find the angular acceleration now that we know time and we also know the change in um, angular displacement to be pi radians. So putting in numbers into this expression, we can solve for the angular acceleration to be 7.1 radians per second per second. Question 28. We have a constant force that is applied for a constant time at various points on an object as shown. If point B is the axis of rotation, so here's our axis of rotation, rank on the magnitude, I'm going to underline that, in the change in the object's angular momentum due to the force. We're going to rank from smallest to largest. This is an application here um, of the uh, angular impulse. So as I've mentioned, if you see torque and you see time, you should be thinking angular impulse, which means you should be thinking change in angular momentum. So we have the equations here to help us analyze this problem. Let's start with uh, B. Let's look at the force B. Well, its distance from where it's applied to the axis of rotation is zero. Therefore, there's zero torque exerted by force B. All right. So this means if R is zero forces, you know, there's no torque, bottom line. So that's easy. That's a good place to start. Now we can look at C. Well, it has a relatively small R, okay? Relatively small R. Um, so let's leave that at that. Uh, small R equals small torque. Then we have a larger torque for A. Now look at this. And it's exerted at some angle less than 90. Okay, so that's good to know. And lastly, we have our extreme D exerted at maximum distance 
for this object and maximum uh, the force is completely perpendicular to the lever arm, which means this has the maximum torque. Now, notice it's the constant time. So when we're considering time, time is the same for all of them. So really, we're just ranking this based on the torques, which means we can answer this question that B, which has zero, um, angular momentum is less than C, less than A, and less than D. Question 29, a disc with a rotational inertia of one kilogram times meters squared spins about an axle whose center, uh, about the center of mass with an angular velocity of 10 radians per second. A second disc, which is not turning, but it does have rotational inertia, because it has mass, and that second disc is slid along the axle until it makes contact with disc one, which was initially spinning. The discs stick together and become a system. What is the angular velocity of the two disc system? Angular velocity, angular momentum is conserved in this collision. As long as there's no net external torque to the system, which there's not, angular momentum is conserved. So that means that our initial angular momentum equals our final angular momentum, which means when we factor in the rotational inertia for the two disks, we're going to need to add the rotational inertia for our final angular momentum because they're a two disc system. And that's why you see the rotational inertia one plus rotational inertia two. Should feel very similar to what we did in our unit looking at um, conservation of momentum and impulse. Very similar. We need to add the masses. So um, we refer to that as a perfectly inelastic collision when they stuck together while well, we added masses. Same thing here, guys. So we're adding these rotational inertia and we uh, have the rotational inertia, which we're given in the problem, but it's still good to remember. Um, so that's equal to one half MR squared, which means we can put in some values here. What is our initial angular momentum? It's simply 1 times 10, okay? And using the right-hand rule, this is going to give you a, a positive angular velocity, okay? So the, these are positive values. What do we have for our values after the collision in which angular momentum is conserved? Well, we're going to add the two. Notice how this simply goes away. I just put it there for you to see it. It goes away because disk 1 does not have any initial angular momentum. Now, when they stick, we add 1 plus 0 0.25, and now we're going to solve for omega final by dividing both sides by the rotational inertia of the system, which is 1.25 kilograms meter squared, which gives us a final angular velocity of 8 radians per second. In question 30, Sophia spins on a rotating pedestal with an angular velocity of 8 radians per second. Eric throws a small exercise ball, which increases her rotational inertia from 2 to 2.5 kilograms times meters squared. What is Sophia's angular velocity after she catches the ball? We are going to neglect any external torque from the ball. So we're going to neglect that for now. Okay, so this is another application of the conservation of angular momentum where our initial angular momentum equals our final angular momentum. Initially, Sophia is spinning. In the final scenario, Sophia is spinning, but she has now caught a ball. And that ball has some rotational inertia. That means we're going to sum these rotational inertia 
just like we did in question 29. So that allows us to get some values here that we can plug in and dividing both sides by the combined rotational inertia of the Sophia exercise ball system. We can solve for the uh, final angular velocity to be 6.4 radians per second. Question 31, we have four particles, each of mass m, that move in an xy plane with varying velocities as shown. So we have our Cartesian plane here. The velocity vectors are drawn to scale. In other words, the magnitude, uh, the size of these arrows indicates the um, magnitude of the velocity, and of course the direction is given as well. We are asked to rank these based on their angular momentum about the origin. So at this point, I, I bet this has you really thinking some of the preceding facts before this problem basically go through the fact that an object moving in a straight line can have angular momentum relative to a defined axis of rotation. So in the schematic here, you can see that in before the scenario here, this, this tennis ball has, or excuse me, um, not the tennis ball, this rod about this defined axis O has zero rotational uh, velocity, zero angular velocity. Then the tennis ball collides with the rod. And all of a sudden, the rod angularly accelerates. So now it has a positive angular velocity. Based on conserva conservation of angular momentum, that means that ball must have had angular momentum relative to the axis O. Let's look at this for our scenario in problem 31. Let's go ahead and I have a circle here drawn to help understand. And we are asked about this. So relative to the origin. So this is our defined axis of rotation, which means these may have varying degrees of angular momentum. This is so cool. To help understand this, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw my radio vectors out. So these radio vectors extend from the origin, which is our defined axis of rotation, and they extend out to where the objects are given their velocities, okay? Varying degrees of tangential velocities and masses are the same. So, we have our trig sine theta that we're also going to need to take into consideration. I love this. So here are the angles theta. And these angles are the angles between the radial vector and the velocity vector. So where they are indicated on this diagram is accurate. So we're just, we're not given specific numbers. We really don't care, but we can use these to, to rank um, A through D relative to their angular momentum. So start with D. If we look at D here, we can see, well, the angle here is zero, zero degrees. So there's zero angular momentum. And that, I hope it makes sense because that object is moving directly away from that defined origin. So that one is equal to zero. Then let's look at C. This is our other extreme. We have a maximum angular momentum because we have here a 90 degree angle, which is going to maximize our value here, given the mass is the same. Also, don't forget velocity. Don't forget that. 
So C, D, and B all have the same magnitude of velocity. So we can consider those all at once here since the magnitude, in other words, this is going to be the same for um, B, C, and D. So we're purely looking at this angle here in this instance. Let's now look at A. A is our other extreme. Not only is the value for the magnitude of the velocity less than B, C, and D, but it's also at some angle, um, much, you know, much less than 90 degrees, say 45 degrees. It really doesn't matter. It's less than 90 degrees. So that's going to help us figure out B. B, out of these angles in A and B look similar. They look very similar, and we're not given any information, so it's okay to assume they're the same. However, velocity of B is greater than A. The velocity vector for B is greater than A, which allows us then to make our final ranking here. That C is greater than B, greater than A, which is greater than D. Remember, D was zero. All right, let's move on. Question 32. A uniform rod of mass M is at rest on a frictionless table. A ball of Play-Doh with a mass of M divided by 2 is moving with a speed V sub 1 as shown here. The ball of Play-Doh collides and sticks to the rod. Derive an expression for the speed of the center of mass of the rod Plato system. And your derivation needs to be in terms of V sub 1 and, as usual, if applicable, any other fundamental constants. All right, this is cool. So let's talk about what's happening here. First and foremost, I hope I've made it abundantly clear in class when you see this term center of mass for a system, you need to stop and think about what the center of mass will do, how the center of mass will act. So the center of mass is going to obey Newton's second law. We've looked at this extensively. Also, momentum is going to be conserved in collisions, given there's no external forces, external torques, etc., to the system. And in this case, there's not. So we have a Plato rod system. Let's think about the center of mass. Well, the center of mass for this Plato rod system is going to lie somewhere around in here. Well, what is it going to do? after the collision. Let's think about it. Let's think about what was occurring. This is moving in a straight line. This rod was stationary. This system will rotate, but we are asked about the center of mass for the system. The center of mass is going to move off in a straight line. It's going to do exactly what was occurring before when, it, when this was moving in a straight line. It stuck. This was not moving. What's the center of mass going to do? Move off in a straight line. Is the system going to rotate? Sure. But it's going to rotate about its center of mass, which is moving off in a straight line. We just need to derive an expression for the velocity here. So it's intuitive that the velocity after the collision is going to be less than the velocity before because it's now a system and that system means we're going to be adding the mass of the rod and the mass of the play-doh so i love this question because it gets you thinking and you're stuck in this rotational mode and i get that don't forget to think about what the center of mass is going to do so we're just going to look at the conservation of, of linear momentum here, and we can derive this expression uh, quite easily. So we have the mass of object 1, velocity 1, plus 
zero. Where'd zero come from? The rod. Remember, it's not moving initially. Then we're adding the mass of the rod and the mass of the Play-Doh, and we have some final velocity. Next, we can plug in the values. Remember the three-step plan for deriving any expression. Now we're going to plug in the values given to us in the problem. So we have m over 2, um, and that is the mass of the Play-Doh. And then so we're going to be adding m over 2 plus m in for our final momentum. Looking at that a little bit further to help you distinguish here for the fractions, we have 1 half, and then we're adding... Um, one half to two halves, or we have one and a half, which is three over two. Um, whichever way works for you. If you're a fraction person, great. If you're thinking decimals and numbers, great. No worries. But three divided by two is going to be our total mass here. So we have 1.5 m. And of course, our final velocity. Let's multiply both sides by the reciprocal of three halves. And we can ultimately solve this problem multiplying one half times the reciprocal of three halves, which is two thirds. And that gives us a final velocity for the Plato rod system of one third V sub one. So we've followed, we've, we've derived our expression. We're in terms of V one. Uh, there's no other fundamental constants in this problem. And the answer is simply that the Plato rod system will move off with one third the velocity that the Plato had prior to the collision. It will move off in a straight line because the center of mass is going to obey Newton's second law. Question 33. We have a planet... P is orbiting the sun in an elliptical orbit. Using quantitative reasoning, explain how to determine the torque exerted by the force of the sun on the planet. Force of the sun on the planet. Let's only look at part A first. Let's look at planet and consider the force of the sun on planet P. You can see here, I've indicated a small force directed toward the sun. Okay, that attractive force. Okay, so now let's draw a straight line uh, radio vector from the sun to the planet. All right, so, and even though we're dealing with an ellipse, we can, this still works. So we can at least see that this is the um, radius, okay? So given that this is the radius, these two vectors, that's 180 degrees. 180 degrees, when we use our equation for torque, is going to give us sine 180 is zero, that's gonna give us zero torque. So in this situation, there's zero torque. What about when the planet moves further along its elliptical orbit, say position two? Same deal. Notice the magnitude of the force is a greater, okay? The magnitude of the force is greater than it was in the first example. Let's look at the radius from that axis, 180 degrees, zero torque. Moving on. Now we're very close, closest position in this elliptical orbit. And we can see this is where there's the greatest force, the greatest attractive force. However, it's at 180 degrees. There's zero torque. A final position here. We can look at the magnitude of the force and we can look at the radius and it's fairly obvious, zero torque. So that is our answer to part A of this question. Now, part B, using semi-qualitative reasoning, explain how the angular momentum is conserved in this sun-planet system. Okay, so we have an object that is moving around 
the sun in an elliptical orbit. I That's obvious. So we're going to be looking at how the angular momentum is conserved. It must be conserved if there are no net external torques, no net external forces on the system, and there are none. So our goal here is to, to show and to prove that using a semi-quantitative, semi-qualitative perspective. All right, so what do we know about the velocity of the planet at this location? It's tangential to the orbit, and it is maximum. It is at the maximum speed. And we looked at that in part A. We looked at the forces going on there. Okay, so we're going to be using our expression here for the rotational angular momentum of an object moving in a line. However, we have a, a defined axis, the sun. And so we're looking at the angular momentum of this object moving tangentially. Um, of course, it's going to uh, continue its orbit, but at this instant, its velocity vector is directed as up the screen, as you can see here, and our defined axis of rotation is the sun. So this is what we're going to use to show how angular momentum is conserved. Here is our um, radius here, our radial vector extending straight out from the defined axis of rotation, and we're going to look at that for all positions in this elliptical orbit first. So let's extend our radio ve vector all the way out. Let's go ahead and look at our planet P starting position. Let's extend the radio vector all the way out. Let's do that for our final position. Notice the red arrow is getting larger. That's because the planet now has a greater tangential velocity, has its greatest here, and given this figure, its smallest tangential velocity when it's the furthest away from the sun. Let's extend our final radio vector here and answer this problem. Considering our angles theta, which are defined as the angle between the radial vector and the velocity vector, as shown on this diagram. We can then finally rank this system by saying the following. As the radius increases, what is happening to the velocity? Take this far one out here. What's happening to the velocity? It's going down, okay? What about in this position here when it's maximized? Here we have our greatest velocity, but our smallest radius. And you can use that reasoning throughout. Now, yes, there's sine theta, there's some trig going on here. But in general, you can see as the distance from the planet to the sun decreases, in other words, R is small, V is big. Mass is the same for the orbiting object. Okay? So if you think about it, that's one way to use a, a mixture of our equations and words and reasoning to show, okay, I get this. It makes sense. As radius goes up, velocity goes down, and vice versa. Therefore, angular momentum is conserved. Next, question 34. A person rolls a solid ball of mass 7 kilograms and a radius 10.9 centimeters down a lane with a velocity of 6 meters per second. You are asked to find the rotational kinetic energy. This is our first rotational kinetic energy problem for the bowling ball. Okay? And we're going to call this a solid ball, assuming it does not slip. Find the total kinetic energy. Let's get to it. If an object has both translational or linear and rotational motion, then the total kinetic energy can be found with this equation. 
And this is in some of the preceding facts on the problem set. And I love this part of the course because it allows us to go back to some of our earlier lab investigations where we were only considering translational motion and we found things were off just a little bit for that marble rolling down the incline. This explains why. Okay, so um, given our values here, total kinetic energy, we have one half mv squared, and now we're adding that rotational kinetic energy, which is one half multiplied by the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular velocity squared. So looking now at our values for the rotational inertia, we have a solid sphere, so let's use two-fifths mr squared in this computation. We have the rotational um, energy, so if, let's knock that out first, um, and that's equal to one-half, and then in parentheses we have the rotational inertia for a solid sphere, a solid ball, and that was two-fifths m r squared, and then we're going to multiply that by the angular velocity squared. When you do this, you will notice that we have our equation to go between the angular um, velocity or rotation, um, rotational velocity to the tangential, okay? And that's one thing I've asked you to do is to consider the what how we go between linear and translational excuse me translational which would be linear and rotational uh, motion is we're dividing by the radius i always joke the common denominator is the radius well that allows us to go back and forth between translational and rotational motion so i want you to look at this if we have omega squared then we have our tangential velocity squared over the radius squared. Here's another way to look at it. Tangential velocity is equal to the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. Well, look at this. Look what we have there. What does that equal? Essentially, that equals tangential velocity squared. If you can see that, that's great. Here is another way to do it. All right, so here I've simply substituted in omega squared and said that's tangential velocity squared over radius squared, okay? Now, we can go ahead and plug in our values. 50.4 joules is the result of this computation here, okay? Plug it in, and you will get 50.4 joules. Take your, um, your velocity and square it. That was 36 over here. Take your radius, um, and you can take that and square it. So that was 0 0.109, and you're squaring it. And so I'm not going to do this. That's simple algebra. You get 50.4 joules. Now let's take the other portion of our total kinetic energy, which is the translational portion, and we have one half multiplied by the mass of the ball and the speed of the ball squared. That's going to give us a total kinetic energy of 176 joules. 176 joules. Sophia kicks a soccer ball which rolls across the field with a velocity of 5 meters per second. What is the ball's total kinetic energy? The ball has a mass, it has a radius, and it does not slip as it rolls. And you're given the rotational inertia for a hollow sphere as two-thirds mr squared. Okay, just as we did in question 34, this is an application of the fact that this object has both linear and rotational motion. So we're adding those two together to find the total kinetic energy, which includes translational and rotational components. So here's our go-to equation. Total kinetic energy. Okay, we have 1 half mv squared, and let's knock out the rotational part first. 1 half 
And then we've plugged in our value here for the rotational kinetic energy. That's where this comes from, or excuse me, the rotational inertia is right here, 2 thirds mr squared, which you're given in the problem, and then that multiplied by omega squared. Now, just as I explained in the last example, remember the common denominator when going between the rotational and translational motion is the radius. So recall that the angular velocity is equal to the tangential velocity divided by the radius. Therefore, we can plug into or recognize rather in this equation that omega squared is equal to tangential velocity squared over radius squared. And if you didn't view the solution for question four, another approach to this was recognizing that the tangential velocity is equal to the angular velocity multiplied by radius. Well, what do we have here? That's nothing more than v squared. So that's another way. Depends how you see it and what's most intuitive to you. Bottom line is when you're dealing with both translational and rotational quantities, keep that in mind that you may need to use this um, to convert between angular and rotational or angular and linear quantities. Just keep it in mind, please. So now moving forward to solve this, we can plug and chug and complete our algebra here. We have one half the mass, the speed squared, which is five squared, plus one third. Okay, where did that come from? One half, all right, multiplied by two thirds. And then we have the mass and we have the speed squared. Okay, and you can see here, I hope that the radius squared goes away, it cancels out, um, depending on which method you chose. So now we have our rotational, we have our translational, which means we can add these two together to get 8.9 joules total energy. All right, so question 36, we have an ice skater, she's spinning with a specific angular velocity. She brings her arms and legs closer to her body, which is reducing her rotational inertia. In this case, we're told to half of its original value. What happens to her velocity? What happens to her rotational kinetic energy? Use a semi-qualitative or quantitative perspective, a mixture of numbers, equations, and a sentence or so that supports your answer. We have done this in class. If we haven't gotten there, we're going to get out our rotational platforms and have some fun demonstrations going on here in the classroom. So um, considering a, a, a very generic formula for rotational inertia, you see some commonalities in all of them. Regardless, we have this distance, this length, this radius, and it's squared. We're also gonna look at the conservation of angular momentum here where the initial angular momentum equal the final angular momentum. Here is a schematic diagram showing before and after. Oftentimes we can use a superscript or this symbol here prime to show after. Um, so that's what that's indicating before and this is pronounced as prime or after um, nothing new. We've been doing that throughout the entire course. Just thought I would explain for this schematic. Um, you know, this also makes me think of Maggie the Penguin. If you remember Maggie, she was someone we looked at in a problem dealing with the conservation of two-dimensional linear momentum. So it just made me think of Maggie, um, you know, here when we're visiting this uh, angularly. So Let's go ahead and solve this problem. If we look at our initial and give that the quantity, and then we look at our final and give it its quantity in terms of the angular momentum, I'm going to go ahead and we're told that it is one half. So I is one half. That's where that's coming from. If these are indeed equal, and they are, 
because there are no net external forces, no net external torques to her. So it is conserved. All right, I think you get that. So in order for um, L initial to L equal L final or L prime, the following must be met. And because her rotational inertia is reduced by one half, you all should see that her angular velocity is going to double if this is to hold true. Okay, so before, um, now let's look at her kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy before and after. We're going to use the same methodology here. So we have before and then after we know her angular, um, excuse me, rotational inertia has been reduced by one half. That has been put into the equation. We already know that her angular velocity doubles. We figured that out just through an intuition of the conservation of angular momentum. Um, one goes up, the other goes down. And so in this case here, we need to look at the fact that when the angular velocity doubles, well, remember, it's squared for energy. So the result of this computation here proves that her rotational kinetic energy is going to double. All right. And if, if, if energy is doubling, if there, go back to work energy theorem, where a work is equal to a change in energy. Well, if we have a change in energy here, that means that work was done, which means she's, she's doing some sort of work when she's pulling in her arms and legs. Okay, very good. Question 37. Find the speed of a disk of radius 0 0.5 meters and mass 2 kilograms at the base of an incline. The disc starts at rest and rolls down the incline from a height of 5 meters. There's no slipping involved. We get that the angle of inclination is 20 degrees above the horizontal. Let's find the speed of the disc. So we have a mixture of linear and rotational quantities in this problem. We're going to also use the conservation of energy, which you've read about in some of the preceding facts. We can still use this. We did it back in unit three, and we're going to do it again right now. So what is our initial energy, our total mechanical energy initially? Well, that is the potential energy, okay? Gravitational potential energy relative to a defined zero line, which we can just call this zero clearly, okay? So we have mass, acceleration due to gravity, change in height, which is five meters. And that's going to be equal to the uh, translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy. All right, so... Moving forward, looking at the rotational inertia for a disk, we can see it is one half mr squared. And that means we can start plugging into our expression. Notice now one half mr squared has been inserted for the rotational inertia of a disk. We're given the other quantities we need, um, such as radius and mass. Recall that when we're going between rotational and linear quantities, that we often will need to use the fact that omega angular velocity is equal to tangential velocity divided by radius. Or if I multiply both sides by r, then I get that the tangential velocity is equal to the rotational velocity multiplied by the radius. We can use this to go back and forth between rotational and translational quantities, and that's nothing new. We're going to do it here as well. So we can now get rid of our rotational velocity, and now we have it in terms of the tangential velocity. All right, so um, 
And as I've said throughout, you could have recognized this um, as well and plugged it in because these are going to go away. So you could have simply said radius squared times the angular velocity squared. Isn't that equal to tangential velocity squared? And the answer is yes, it sure is. So you could have just plugged that in. Whichever one's most intuitive to you, no worries. But our squared radius cancels out here which means we now have this in all translational quantities, which means we can start to clean it up a little bit here. And what do we see about mass? You can cancel mass out of this expression. So mass does not matter. Next, we have our velocities and we have our fractions that we're gonna be adding to equal 3 quarters velocity squared. That means we can now multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 3 fourths and take the square root to solve for the tangential velocity or speed of the disk at the bottom of the incline. And it's pretty cool that all of this simplifies to such a beautiful expression here. And your answer is 8.16 meters per second. Here's a question for you. If you were to go back to unit three and solve this using only translational linear quantities, you would see that you would get a speed at the base of the incline, and that speed was a little greater than what you found experimentally as we rolled all kinds of objects down inclines throughout this course. Now you can explain that. If you were to solve this problem only using translational quantities, you would get a speed of 10 meters per second. However, when we consider the rotational quantities and the rotational inertia, we get a, a, a speed less than 10. So cool. Question 38. A hoop with a rotational inertia of 0.1 kilograms times meters squared, it's spinning about a frictionless axle with an angular velocity of five radians per second. At what radius from the center of the hoop should a force of two newtons be applied for three seconds in order to accelerate the hoop to an angular speed now of 10 radians per second? Wow. Let's lay out everything we know so we can tackle this problem. We know our initial angular velocity. We know our final angular velocity. We know our change in time to be three seconds. We're given a force of two newtons and uh, an overall rotational inertia for the hoop of 0 0.1 kilograms times meters squared. And we need to find the radius for this one. It's, this is a little different, but when you lay out all of these variables, um, hopefully it becomes a little bit easier. Let's look at Newton's angular analog to the second law, which states the sum of the torque is equal to the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. Next, what is torque? Well, <laughs> it's the a uh, perpendicular component of a force multiplied by the distance. And so we have that. I'm only doing this to, to model and approach. Students get overwhelmed with some of these problems. And, and arguably, they're, they're quite simple once you tease apart all the variables. What is angular acceleration? It is nothing more than the angular velocity, final minus angular velocity initial, divided by the change in time. Therefore, we can look at torque and set torque, which is force times the distance from that force um, to the axis of rotation. And we can set that equal to our rotational inertia, which we have, um, multiplied by the change in the angular velocity divided by the change in time. Now, the physics is really done. This is a plug and chug fest. All we're going to do is plug in our force given, us, given to us in the problem, R, which we don't know, rotational inertia, check, initial and final angular velocities, check, check, and the change in time, good to go. Therefore, solving this algebraically, 
we can get a value of 0 0.08 meters or 8 centimeters. Now, one thing that I should point out is that, again, anytime, anytime you have a force exerting a torque for a duration of time, I want you to be thinking about angular impulse. So there is an alternative solution to this problem. If this was how you solved it, I applaud you. That's great. Either one works. But you can use the fact that there is an angular impulse exerted on the hoop. And so you can solve this problem using the angular momentum and the conservation of angular momentum and the fact that a torque exerted over a period of time which we're given is equal to the change in the angular velocity. That's critical. Change. A lot of students ignore that. It's equal to the angular velocity. No, it's equal to the change in the angular momentum. Use this approach and you'll get the exact same answer, I assure you. Question 39. Now we get to really have some fun. I love static equilibrium problems. I love them. Two ropes having tensions T2 and T3 support a 10 meter long, 10 kilogram beam and two weights. If the right weight has a mass of 25 kilograms and T2 has a tension of 500 newtons, calculate the tension in T3. Also find the mass of the unknown weight. All right, let's label this thing and figure out what's going on. This is static equilibrium, where the sum of the torque and the sum of the forces all equal zero. We have the torque exerted by the force mass gravity of the center of mass of the bar, which would be 10 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity, 100 newtons. Then let's look at our mass, 25 kilograms. Again, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity gives me a force of gravity exerted of 250 newtons by that mass. Now, consider the force of tension. Force of tension, as we've gone through starting in our dynamics unit, is going to be equal and opposite here for the tension. And if you sum the forces for the 25 kilogram object only, you'll show in static equilibrium, 250 newtons is going to be equal to the upward force for this object. So moving on. Next, we have our unknown mass. We don't know the mass. We, we know it's exerting some sort of torque um, driven by the force of gravity here, but that's all we know. Then we have T2 and T3 we need to also consider. So we're given T2, we're given that it's 500 newtons. T3, we don't know. So we have a lot of stuff to try to figure out in this problem, and this can be overwhelming, but you're just going to sum forces and sum torques. Be smart about your axis of rotation, and it's all going to work out. So let's put our axis here. The reason for that, quite simple. We don't know anything about this mass other than where it is, relative to the other forces and torques, we don't know. So, and you might be thinking, well, we don't know T3 either. That's right. But now we only have one unknown variable, so we can solve. Remember, you choose the axis of rotation on these equilibrium problems. And you often choose them where, say, you know nothing about uh, a force uh, or an object, or maybe you choose them where you can cancel more than one torque. So be smart about where you choose it. Now we can solve this problem. Okay, 
look at our directions of torques always. Otherwise, this is overwhelming. T4, negative torque, use the right hand rule relative to our defined axis of rotation. We have a negative torque. Remember a negative torque? That's going to be in the counterclockwise direct or in the clockwise direction, excuse me. So right hand rule, this vector is actually going into the computer screen, into your paper. This is a negative torque. It is a clockwise moment. Let's look at our other ones. We have a positive counterclockwise torque exerted by T3. We have another negative torque clockwise exerted by the center of mass of the bar. We have a positive torque exerted by the force of tension 2 on this system. Now, let's start summing forces, summing torque. Conditions for static equilibrium, both must equal zero. Summing the torque here, we um, have our uh, a T3, so we're over here. We don't know T3, not yet. And the distance from the defined axis of rotation to T3 is going to be eight meters, okay? Because this distance from here to here is, is two meters and you're given this, so it, it's quite simple, you know. 0 0.8 times 10, that's where that comes from. Um, next torque, we're gonna take our positive torques, which are the counterclockwise torques, and subtract the negative torques, which are the clockwise torques. Okay, next positive torque is our 500 um, Newton upward force of tension, and that particular torque is exerted at two meters from our defined axis of rotation. So that's the radius there would be two meters. Now let's subtract the negative torques. All the way out here at our lever arm is a 25 kilogram mass exerting a 250 Newton torque at a distance of 10 meters from our defined axis of rotation. Are we having fun yet? Then we have the center of mass of the bar exerting a torque, uniform mass density, so it's halfway out, which is five meters, and the sum of all these torques must equal zero because this system is in static equilibrium. Therefore, we can um, clean this up just a little bit here. Let's add these torques to both sides. Let's subtract this torque and we are left with the following simplified expression in which we simply divide 200 Newton meters by eight to get our answer of 250 Newtons. So now we know tension force three is 250 Newtons. Now we can go on to solve and find the mass that is exerting this unknown tension force T1. Let's sum the forces vertically. Let's call up positive and down negative to T, T2 plus T3 minus T1 minus T4 minus 100, which is the center of mass, must all equal zero for a system in static equilibrium. Therefore, we can go ahead and plug in all of our values and you see what we're left with here? We know everything. Now we can find T1. And T1 equals 400 Newtons, which means the mass of the unknown object is 40 kilograms. And we've solved everything for question 39. Question 40, more fun. A 75 kilogram block is suspended from the end of a 10 meter long 10 kilogram beam. If theta is given at 30 degrees, what are the values of T2 as well as the horizontal and vertical forces on the hinge? Okay, let's start labeling. Labeling our forces. Here we have the center of mass of the beam, uniform mass density. We have an object of 75 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity gives you 750 newtons. What else do we have? 
we acknowledge the fact that this tension force is also 750 newtons, as these are equal and opposite in direction. If you sum the forces for this object vertically, you would show they were equal and opposite in direction, and you know that. So moving on, we have a force of tension, T2, and it is at an angle theta. That means our resultant vector must be resolved into vertical and horizontal component. We have another force at an angle, which means it must also be resolved into its X and Y components. So looking at that, looking at the hinge force, there's a component that goes up the wall, a component going out radially from the wall into the beam. Looking at our tension force here, there's a component upward, there's a component that's acting radially as well. And so we're gonna be doing some trigonometry there, which is exciting. And we're going to put our axis of rotation smack on that hinge. Why? Because that's the smartest thing to do because even though we're being asked about the hinge, we don't know anything about it other than the forces, but we don't know the amount. Furthermore, we can cancel that torque. Torque at that point becomes zero. And remember the sum of the torque and the sum of the forces for a system in static equilibrium equals zero. Before we move on to our summations, let's talk about the direction of the torque. Starting with the 70 kilogram mass, that exerts a negative torque. A negative torque is a clockwise moment. Moving on, center of mass, negative torque, a clockwise rotation, a clockwise moment. Force of tension two, and again, that's gonna be that vertical component, Ty, okay? That exerts a positive torque, which is a counterclockwise moment. Now let us sum the forces. Summing the torque, we have our tension force two. Let me start with the trig there. Sine 60, well you're given theta is equal to 30, which means we have this 90 and this angle here is equal to 60. Doesn't matter what trig you use. I have simply chosen to use this angle 60 in this problem. Therefore, if I'm trying to solve for this component, which is the vertical component, sine theta is equal to opposite over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the resultant vector of T2. That's where T2 sine theta comes from, sine 60. Distance 0 0.25 um, multiplied by the length of 10 gives me 2.5 meters away from our defined axis of rotation. That's a positive torque. Now we subtract our two negative torques, which are much easier. 100 Newton torque by the center of mass. It is five meters out from our defined axis. 750 Newton torque. It is the full 10 meters out from the axis. And those torque must equal zero. Now, we can clean this up a little bit by adding our negative torques to both sides of the equation to equal 8,000 Newton meters. Next, let's divide by the 2.5 meters along with sine 60. Please don't forget to divide by sine 60 as well. That's going to give us a, a resultant overall force for T2 of 3,695 newtons. So now we know T2, which means we can go on and find information about this hinge force. Okay, so the hinge force and the force, a component of the force of tension are acting in the horizontal direction. And they're the only two acting that way. Calling right positive and left negative, we can sum the forces horizontally, which must 
also equal uh, zero for a system in static equilibrium, which means the horizontal component of the hinge force is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the horizontal component of the force of tension. Well, we know the horizontal component of the force of tension. We can find that using trig right here. And we now know what T2 is. We found that earlier in the problem. Using trig and the angle theta of 60 degrees, we can say that it is adjacent. And therefore, we have our hypotenuse, which is T2 multiplied by sine theta or sine 60. And that must be equal to the horizontal component of the hinge force and thus equal to 3,695 cosine 60, which gives us an answer of 1,848 newtons. That is the horizontal component, but we still need to figure out the vertical component. So we can do that quite easily by plugging in what we just calculated, and we can plug it back into our uh, a vertical summation and solving for the vertical summation. Now that we know that these are equal and opposite, we can simply put that in here, which was the same number here, same thing, or excuse me, no, it's not. Disregard that. Um, we have our overall force of tension, which we found here, and that is sine of 60 degrees, which is that vertical piece. And now we can figure out our vertical component of the hinge force to be, I love this part, negative 2,350 newtons. So here is the point. And you're thinking, wait a minute, you said it was up the wall. Well, we assumed but it's not. By summing the forces and summing the torque, we have discovered this force is not up the wall. This force is acting down the wall, okay? This is a downward force on the bar. Think about it. In this situation, we have these torques that are at this far distance from the lever arm exerting a torque and that torque is pushing up on the hinge on the wall which means that the hinge is directing a force downward onto the bar so in this case here we have discovered that the vertical force of the hinge is actually pointed vertically but down the wall at a, a force vector of 2,000, negative 2,350 newtons. Very cool stuff. Question 41. A board of length L and uniform mass density is placed against a rough wall. The coefficient of static friction between the board and the wall is 0 0.4, and the coefficient of static friction between the board and the floor is 0 0.5. Find the minimal angle theta that the board can form with the floor before it slips. And so here's a schematic. Now, oftentimes, I will give this challenge problem out as extra credit um, or as an optional challenge problem. So I chose not to go through a full-blown solution in this video. I think I'm going to save that for a discussion in class or perhaps a separate video. But I do want to give you a number of hints to help you solve this problem. This problem <laughs> is fun. Number one, you should have five forces labeled on the board. Number two, choose an axis of rotation wisely. In other words, 
You want to choose it for some component here that you have not, nothing on, no information on. Because when you do that, the torques go to zero. And I'm sure you've learned that after the half dozen or so static equilibrium problems we've already worked out in class. So step three, use the line of action for the force to help you find the lever arm. So in this static equilibrium problem, extend your forces, which recall that's called the line of action. And use that line of action to help you figure out the lever arm or the moment arm, which is the perpendicular distance from the force to the defined axis of rotation. Next, try to express all of your angles in terms of theta. I wish you all the best of luck on question 41. Come talk to me about it in class. And finally, remember, physics is fun. That's my final clue. Question 42. Examine the wheel and the two forces, F1, F2, in this schematic diagram. What magnitude of force 2 will be required for the wheel to be in rotational equilibrium? All right, so here in this problem, um, we're, we want the clockwise torques to equal the counterclockwise torques. To be in rotational equilibrium, the sum of these torques must equal zero. So let's take our positive torques and subtract our negative torques. Force one is exerting a positive torque. Force two is exerting a negative torque, which is a clockwise torque, which is directed into your paper, into your screen, into your phone, however you're viewing this. Um, and those must equal zero. So given this information, let's add our negative torque to both sides. Fairly straightforward. And solve for force two. Now, I want to also point out, again, you see the extension here of the radio vector. The correct angle theta is in between the radio vector and the force vector. So our angle theta here between these two is actually going to be 45 degrees. Supplementary angles will give you the exact same answer. And uh, this equation is very forgiving in that aspect as we've talked about throughout this entire problem set. So let's solve this problem. If we divide the left side by 0 0.1 meters, which is the radius, we can solve for force two to be equal to 2.65 newtons. That's the force that is required for this system to be in equilibrium. Question 43. A wheel of radius R and negligible mass is mounted onto a horizontal frictionless axle such that the wheel is on a vertical plane. Okay, so it can spin just like in our video um, analysis question that we, we, we did earlier in the problem set. Five small objects of varying masses are mounted onto the rim, the outermost rim, as shown. If the system is in static equilibrium, what is the value of capital M in terms of lower case M? Are we having fun or what? So this is a just a kind of a crazy little problem here. Um, and I thought it would be a fun challenge problem here toward the end of the problem set. So let's look at this. We have these masses. Let, let's draw and, and consider the forces that are being exerted. All right. So it's mass times the acceleration due to gravity, the force of gravity for these five masses. So I'm just going to draw some, some force uh, vectors based on just, I'm just going to draw them and we're going to go from there. It's going to help conceptualize a problem. Trust me. So I have this capital M, 
I have a, a, a lowercase m as we work our way around. Um, I have uh, one half m. I have three m. And then I have this guy here at the top. Hopefully you can say and see, hey, this one here is not exerting any torque at all um, due to the fact that the force is acting in the same exact direction as the radial vector. So there's, there's no force exerted, no torque, excuse me, exerted here for this object. Some of the torque, some of the forces must equal zero for a system in static equilibrium. And so what I'm going to do is draw a line of action for these guys here, especially this object and this object. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you why here in a minute. Let's go ahead and draw a line of action. Remember, that's the force extended. And why do we do that? We do that to help us find the lever arm, the perpendicular distance from the force to the axis of rotation, okay? Which is obviously here. So now that we have our line of actions drawn, you can see that we are going to use the perpendicular distance, um, no surprise. So we have the torque, and we've talked about this throughout this entire unit. We're going to take the full component of the force, and we're going to multiply it by the perpendicular distance for two of these objects. It's easier this way. So what's our angle theta here? Well, it's going to be 45 degrees. Um, for both of these, for, for all of these, are going to be 45 degrees. And so summing our torques, let's look at our positive torques and subtract our negative torques. So we have a positive torque here, and then we have MR. That's a positive torque. Remember right-hand rule? You'll want to use that counterclockwise direction is a positive um, torque. And we're going to subtract our negative or clockwise torques from this, which are exerted by the M divided by 2, as well as this 3M over on this side. So that all must equal 0. So we're getting somewhere now. And if you are wondering one last time, R cosine 45 is R perpendicular. It is called the lever arm or the moment arm. It was found here by using the line of action and recognizing here that this force opposite and then we wanted the adjacent. So we're trying to find what's in red here because that is the perpendicular uh, lever arm. Okay, And we can do that by taking our cosine 40 for this problem. And same deal over here. Cosine 45 will give us our perpendicular. All right, let's move on. Okay, so now that we have our summation completed and we've gone through and we have a plan, let's knock this thing out here. Let's sum our torque, clean up the torques, and um, take our negative torques and add them to both sides. And then we're going to take this guy here and subtract um, from both sides. So we're, we're isolating capital M. Remember, we're trying to find a value for M, capital M in terms of lowercase m. We're so close. Next step, go ahead and look at what we can simplify. Well, look at this. R, R, radius, radius gone. We can cancel. That's in every part of this expression. So we can cancel out the R's. So we've simplified it even further. Next, we have the mass divided, um, one half mass. So what basically what we're going to do here is we're going to take um, mass one half, which is 0 0.5, cosine 45, Cosine 45 is square root of 2 over 2, okay? Um, so 
if you're a fractions person, great. If you're a decimal person, that works as well. But regardless, we're going to take these and multiply them out. And that's where the 0.35m comes from. One half multiplied, 0.5 multiplied from, um, multiplied by the square root of 2 over 2. And that's where it comes from. 3m, we don't have to mess with. This one here, same deal. We get cosine of 45. Again, square root of 2 over 2, which equals approximately 0.71. And so um, that's where that number comes from. And this is allowing us, we're just going to add these up. And we will get that m is equal to 2.64 lowercase m. So we've done it. We have derived an expression for m in terms of lowercase m. And we find it's 2.64. Now, what I'm going to do now is look back at my diagram and say, okay, when I started off, I drew this vector. This was too big because, look, this is 3m. So just to clean this up, one final step that I feel is important is that this force exerted 2.6m is obviously less than 3m. So I would redraw this vector um, on the diagram to be representative of the magnitude that it is. Question 44. Cammy, which is our cat, walks along a uniform piece of wood that is 4.5 um, meters long and it has a mass of 5 kilograms. The piece of wood is supported by two sawhorses. One is 0 0.5 um, meters from the left end and one is 0 0.5 from the right end. Okay. If Cammy's weight is 35 newtons, how far out on this wooden board can she go before it starts to tip? Now, the reason I've chosen this problem, this is a classic, and I want you to be aware of this. It's a classic conceptual piece for solving this. Now, you could solve this using center of mass. This is obviously... Um, a, uh, an equilibrium problem as well. But what I want to talk to you about are the forces acting the moment this begins to tip. All right. So we have a, a force exerted uh, by the center of mass of the piece of wood. Okay. We also have Cammy the cat, and she's exerting a force. We're not sure how far out she can go, but we see that she is exerting a torque, all right? So we have Cammy exerting a clockwise negative torque in the piece of wood, the center of mass exerting a counterclockwise positive torque. Then we also have the seesaw. There's a force exerted there, the force of the seesaw on the piece of wood, the upward force of the seesaw on the piece of wood. And at this point, you're like, okay, what about force normal over here? What about this force? And that's the purpose of this problem. At the instant this tips, this is no longer in contact with the sawhorse. Thus, there's no force applied. Okay? No force normal. That's the point of this problem. And after you get through that conceptual hurdle, this becomes straightforward. Let us sum the forces now. Pick an axis of rotation. Clearly, you're going to pick the um, fulcrum to be at the rightward seahorse because we don't know anything about it and we know everything else. Now, summing the forces of static equilibrium, saying they will equal zero, we have our negative torque and we're subtracting the or our positive torque subtract the negative torque exerted by Cami the cat, which means we can add that negative torque to both sides, which means we can isolate x, which is the distance Cami can go out on the plank. Solving for x, we get that she can go 1.07 meters past the sawhorse on the right, 
at that exact distance, the system will begin to rotate. It will no longer be in static equilibrium. The board will no longer be in contact with the sawhorse on the left, and the system will angularly accelerate. Question 45. The graph below shows the torque on a disc as a function of time. The mass of the disc is one kilogram. The radius, capital R, is equal to a half a meter. The disc is initially at rest. You know I'm going to underline that. And can rotate freely so we don't have any frictional, non-conservative forces. Calculate the angular velocity of the disc at t equals two seconds. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Well, first and foremost, let's look at the rotational inertia for this object, this disc, one half mr squared. Let's also consider angular momentum. We have a a torque as a function of time graph. The whole purpose for this problem is what are you going to do when you have torque versus time? You're going to acknowledge that this angular impulse is equal to a torque multiplied by a duration at which that torque is applied. Here we have a very simple graph torque, time. So what are we going to do here? We are going to find the area under the graph. And so we have a triangle here and a rectangle. So we're going to find this area, one half base times height. We're going to find this area, base times height. Then we're going to say, wow, we have just found the change in angular momentum, but there's no initial angular momentum, and given the rotational inertia for the disk, we can solve for the final angular velocity. Let's first find the change in angular momentum, which is very easy. It's equal to three newton meter seconds, which is equal to the change in the angular momentum. Now, I, I make a big deal out of that. Students say, oh, torque multiplied by time is equal to angular momentum. Incorrect. It is equal to a change in the ang angular momentum. In this case here, we have zero initial angular momentum. So now we can solve for the final angular velocity of the disk. We found the... Um, this value here by taking the area under. Now we can divide by the rotational inertia, one half mr squared. We know r and we know the mass, which means the rotational inertia is 0 0.125 kilograms times meters squared, which means three divided by 0 0.125 meters, um, kilograms times meters squared gives us 24 radians per second. If you go ahead and look at the SI units here, you'll see they cancel out to an inverse of a second, and our placeholder radians is placed in there, radians per second. Um, kind of fun to look at that sometimes. And this concludes Unit 6 problem set. I'll see you guys in class.